Good afternoon. This thing is pulled to come up, but we'll work with it. But anyway, can you guys stand and we'll greet the family and we'll get started. Seated. it. Hi, Miss Holland. Where's she at? Where's she go? Oh, okay. All right. I know she just left us. Okay, good. That would be like my mom. Was good. She's mom, she hugged my mom, so that was good. So they had to meet and greet and all good. But anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, you know, I, you know we, we knew that um, Coach Holland passed and Miss Holland and the girls, whatever. It was a very sad day, but um, I don't look at it as sad. Totally, I look at it, it's, my theme is better than basketball. It ain't about basketball, right? It's about really life and what basketball means to all here. And sometimes I look around and I see Phil Wendell, which we go way back, and I see Ricky Stokes and Ricky, I'm, we will always talk about this, even after we played, we talk about it now. And Rick said, he always knew when I was ready to play and kick somebody, you know what? So Rick like, well, so today I'm ready to do that again, but I'm not in my basketball uniform, okay? Then I look back at these guys there and I see a, a Jeff Lamb, Lee Raker, Jeff Jones, Terry Gates. Gates used to beat me up a little bit in the Deke house and we wrestled on the floor one time after we beat Carolina and probably tried to break my leg and Coach Allen would have been mad, but it's okay, we got through it. Lee Raker, we go to went to NIT and he had the baseball bat hitting all the lamps on every floor because we won in our teeth. So I think I'm at University Hall right now. You know, obviously the great building we played in. And a lot of memories there from last night. I see another guy here named Mike Owens. When I came, Mike, I haven't seen him in a while. Mike, raise your hand. He was one of the first people that I greeted when I was here. He and Garland Jefferson and the crew and Mark Newman. And I'll get to some more guys at some point in time. But these guys here were very special to me, but I'm gonna introduce the, and sorry, Coach Calipari, you second best. The best coach in college basketball to me, and President Ryan and Carl is here. If we do not sign him for a lifetime contract, we will be sorry, okay? So I'll give, he knows I'm gonna say that, say it all the time, but here's Coach Tony Bennett. Thank, thank you, Ralph. He's a little biased to say that, but um, no, thank you. Uh, to Ann, to Kate, to Ann Michael, and to the Holland family, thank you for um, asking me to just share some opening remarks. It, it means so much. And uh, though I didn't know Terry as well as some of his players and some of the coaches and the people here in attendance, I knew him well enough to know he was awesome and that I loved him. And every time I was around him, I just wanted to give him a big hug and say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for Virginia basketball. Uh, to, to be the coach at UVA, it's such an honor to follow in coach's footsteps. And what he did for Virginia basketball, for this university and for this community is so special and I'll never take it for granted, and I'm forever grateful to be following in his footsteps. And Ann, you told me um, one of Coach's favorites, favorites verses in the Bible, and I thought about it, and I thought it was so appropriate for this setting. It's, it's a, a verse found in 2 Timothy, and it's the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy, who was like his son. Paul was his mentor, very, very similar to what Coach was to to so many of us. And Paul said this to Timothy. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now I will receive the crown of righteousness that the Lord has appointed for me. And when I think of Coach Holland, and I think of his life, you always said he never ever backed away from a challenge, even how he faced life from the beginning all the way to the end of this life. He fought the good fight. He kept the faith. 
and he finished the race. He did it as a, a husband, as a father, I'm sure as a grandfather and a brother. He did it as a coach. He did it as a mentor. He did it as an administrator, a friend. He did it in all those avenues. And I often think, well, what would Coach Holland say to me? What would he say to us coaches, to all of us here? I think he'd say the same thing to us. I know he'd say it to his grandkids. I know he'd say, keep the faith, finish the race, fight the good fight, and whatever endeavor it is. So I'm just grateful to be here to celebrate. It's a sad day, but it's also a day to honor and celebrate. And, um, and I do look forward to that day when I'm with Coach. And we're going to be talking about the memories of Virginia basketball. We're going to be talking about good, hard-nosed, man-to-man defense. And, um, but we'll be in a place where there's no more suffering, no more tears, no more Alzheimer's, only joy in the presence of true love. And we'll rejoice on that day when we're all together. So thank you for inviting me. And what an honor it is to be here. Bless you guys. I think you now see why he's the best coach in college basketball, right? He had the heart, he had the beautiful wife and family, and I got to know him during the um, Final Four run. And um, Mrs. Bennett, what was that dish we had in the, in the room? The, the bologna, some whatever, whatever it was called. She knows what I'm talking about, but it's like a bologna sandwich and some sauce or whatever on some crackers. So that was the after party in their room. So it was good, it works. And then I still, their nephew, I still, he still called me, so it was good, it works. But anyway, it, and, and, it's, and it's another honor to have him here because he, he eclipsed Coach Howard's win record uh, this year. And so congratulations, Coach. And, and to have somebody like that get more wins than Coach Howard is very special, I think, to me and thank everybody here as well. So thanks again. Uh, up next is a, a guy that coached for a while uh, at that other school that we don't like. Um, Two-time ACC coach, coach of the year. Uh, he was here with Coach Holland in 84 and another, but I, he says he's a coach, but he's an analyst that thinks he knows coaching. So uh, Seth Greenberg will take us from here and I'll be back later. Thank you. Ms. Holland and Michael, Kate, I'm honored that you asked me to be part of today's ceremony. When I think of Coach Holland, real quickly, and I remember Coach Allen, what we're gonna to try to do today. My bad, hold on. <laughs> he just pump faked me. I did, fine. So uh, I kind of skipped over because I don't want to get there, but I, I forgot something. You got it. <laughs> and I'm sorry I did, but. Uh, when Ralph to sit down. Yeah, you can sit down. <laughs> you can sit in my chair if you want. <laughs> uh, and and um, that's my excitement, and this is my, um, you know, you got emotions and passion, whatever, but. My two sisters are here, Valerie and Joyce, and I got the best sisters and mom in the world. My dad passed last year, but it's like having a dad, two dads now passed. My high school coach is still living, but my other two sisters are Ann, Michael, and Kate. And I'm going to bring them up now, and uh, they'll say a few words. And then Seth will come back right up there. I want to introduce you again. <laughs> but you can come back up. But uh, there's a picture of me and Ann, Michael, somewhere, and uh, we had get, just gotten beat by North Carolina. She's in my lap crying, but. She's too big to sit in my lap right now, so we won't be crying today. Okay, good. We tried to get him to give us a little pause there. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank President Ryan, Carla Williams, and the University of Virginia for giving our family this unique opportunity to remember our dad in the most special place, surrounded by the people that mean the most to our family. You've always made us feel at home here. For that, we are forever grateful, and it means the world to us. We also want to thank Jerry Capone, Kyle King, and the amazing team that's been working with us daily for the last two months to make today the most perfect celebration. Is it me? It's me. Hmm? I've spent 20 years in medicine. Go. Yeah. Sorry. We're a little nervous. <laughs> the greatest gift dad gave us was our basketball family. I remember waking up one summer morning at the beach and him saying we were having guests because he was going to interview for a new assistant basketball coach. He wanted to see if they were a fit. And that's the first time I met Coach Odom, Mrs. Odom, Ryan, and Lane. 
and we swam and rode bikes and hung out, and I got four new members to my family. Dad understood that our lives as children, always on buses and planes and in the public light, were unique. He also understood that the only people who could relate to growing up in this very fantastic pressure cooker were other coaches' kids. So the Valvano girls spent the night when NC State came to play. Jeff Jones and his family lived three houses to the left, and the Odoms lived two houses to the right. And don't worry, Ryan, we agreed this was not an appropriate venue to talk about your perm <laughs> or gathering in the front yard to watch you break dance to Candy Girl. <laughs> and Michael and I always had 15 older brothers. Rick would come over and practice the piano and play the Charlie Brown theme song while we danced with the promise that then we'd go to bed and leave him alone. How magical that we two little girls had a giant living in the basement who would put up with our playing his records while he was at practice. And he's always been the best big brother in the whole world. Like dad, he always finds time, even when all his minutes are already taken, and he swoops in and puts us on his back to wade through deep waters when we feel like we can't get there on our own. When we had recruits in, dad made pancakes and we all ate breakfast together like a family. Monk, the managers, the Burkheads, it's a wonderful, special family. We got to share some absolutely amazing memories, and some of us are bonded forever knowing the joy of hitting a big shot in, this, in the Graves Mountain Coliseum and having survived gnats that we heard took away a camper once. If Dad could put us all up and down Morris Road, he would have. It's what he cherished most was having everyone together under his wings, and we're just so grateful for every single one of you. I've spent 20 years in medicine, and I feel pretty comfortable with human anatomy. But for the life of me, I cannot figure out how our dad managed to give such enormous, yet equal parts of his heart to so many people. I promise you, my sister and I would both swear we were the most loved daughter. Our kids each felt like the favorite grandchild. And that same feeling translates to his players, his colleagues, his siblings, and our friends. All of you here felt that incredibly special way that only Coach was able to provide, from that normal-sized human heart that had superhuman capabilities. You never guessed where you stood with Coach because he never missed an opportunity to say, I love you. Annie always told us, girls, you share your dad with lots of people, and that might make it hard sometimes, but in return, you will have the biggest family of all. And she was right. And as a result, we are here today feeling the glow of the reflection of his love for each of you. Coach always said, do right so that the man upstairs is ready for you. On a long trip home years ago, our landing gear wasn't registering, so we had to prepare for a crash landing. Panic ensued. But when I looked at my dad, he had the most peaceful smile. I asked if he was scared. He said, not at all. We're in God's hands, so no matter what happens, we don't have to worry. He was a man of great faith, and that was so clearly evident in the grace that he carried himself with up until the very end. He taught us not to fear the souls that we share this planet with. He brought home snakes from cross-country runs, and we cleared every turtle off the highway from Virginia to North Carolina for the better part of the 80s and 90s. He was the king of the critter walks on Figure Eight Island. He loved to share his knowledge about our Earth and our environment. He handed us an octopus. He said, go ready the tank so we could feed it and make it stronger before we let him loose. He was the most gentle giant, and he loved all of God's creatures equally with that big giant heart. When Dad said he was going out to shoot birds, it meant he and Clever were in the boat with a giant video camera shooting footage of the blue heron, baby osprey, and egrets that he loved so much. In the next couple of days, please take a moment to watch a turtle or listen to a bird. They may crave your attention and show off for you. And when they do, please take a moment to think of our father. That's hard to follow. Uh, 
And that's really what we're here for today, to, to remember Coach Holland as a husband, a father, a grandfather, a coach, a mentor, an out-of-the-box thinker, someone who impacted other people's lives and gave of himself. And probably the guys back there would probably say a pretty good prankster. Uh, that's what today's all about, because if you're here, obviously, like all of us here, we've been touched in such a positive, life-lasting way by Coach Holland. Uh, if we could have the Davidson panel, please come forward. Now, this is gonna be a hard panel for me because I've never called Coach Holland Terry in my lifetime. So I'm gonna say Terry once or twice, and I apologize, Mrs. Holland. Like, I've never called you Ann, and I was told by my wife, you better not, so. Dr. Kirkendall, you've known Terry, got through that, <laughs> from the time that he was in your fraternity, to a player, to a coach, and then when he was an administrator under you at Davidson College as the athletic director. What about Coach Holland changed over those years, and what about Coach Holland remained the same? Well, uh, you all need to know that when you talk about whether you call him Coach or Terry, a lot of people have called him different things over the years. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly was Terry Holland to some, Coach Holland or Coach to others. Mr. Holland, occasionally I imagine, getting on an airplane or something. But uh, I first knew him as Pledge Holland. And if ever anybody else used the term of opprobrium to talk about Terry, and uh, called him that bleep, 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 Holland, Pledge Holland was just about as bad in that year, too. <laughs> uh, I, the Terry I knew, uh, of course, first of all, first reaction, tall, very tall. But then next reaction, uh, very graceful, too, a natural athlete. But the overwhelming reaction for me was a friend somebody you could really care about. He was, he was uh, engaged in other people's lives. He was kind. He had uh, a way of being modest, not egotistical at all. He also had a way of being uh, a great practical joker as well, even in college. And the stories abound what Terry did here and there at Davidson for those four years. I knew Terry in college and then we drifted apart not because we didn't like each other, but because we had different things to do in our lives. And for about 20 years, I expect we didn't see each other more than two or three times. And then uh, in 1984, uh, I moved back to Davidson to be the president. I came into a situation in which athletics was kind of on the ropes, so to speak. We had intended to be a dime among the nickels and we wound up being kind of a penny among the dollar bills. So <laughs> something had to change. I hadn't been in Davidson more than a month before I headed for Charlottesville, and I said, Terry, come down and help us. And he loves Davidson, but he said that he had some promises to keep here, and I expect he had some miles to go as well. So he stayed here until about six years into my time at Davidson, and then he did us the great honor of coming to Davidson to be our athletic director. Even before he came as athletic director, he helped me recruit a young, kind of mouthy, Long Island high school basketball coach to come down and be the coach at Davidson. And that young man's name was Bob McKillop. Maybe you all know where that ended up 30 years later. But Terry came to Davidson and he was a natural as an administrator. And all those qualities I spoke about, Steph, that that modesty, that openness, that kindness to other people showed at the same time that he knew how to be an administrator. He was just a natural at that as well. So what I saw in, in those, those years that we worked together at Davidson was somebody who was very much the same as the one I'd known when he was a student at Davidson. He also had grown and expanded. And he knew so many things about human nature that he probably hadn't known as a freshman at Davidson but he knew how to handle everything there. Now, I'm aware of the fact that this university has a, a great claim upon Terry Holland, and rightly so, but I want to let you all know as well 
that we Davidsonians claim him as well. We know the rock from which he was hewn. And we also <laughs> know what kept him going, Anne and Kate and, and Michael, in, into our community as well as in this community as well. I have a great privilege today of saying to you all that at Davidson now, in order to remember Terry Holland, a number of Terry's admirers and friends have made a contribution in order to establish the Holland Family Basketball Performance Center, which is right at the heart of our athletic complex at Davidson. So Davidson joins you all in gratitude for the life of Terry Holland. Jerry Kroll, you scored 1,100 points at Davidson. Uh, you were on an undefeated freshman team coached by Coach Holland. When did you know he was going to be a great coach? And what was your first impression? Because that was his first team that he ever coached. And yet he was undefeated. So Coach probably thought this stuff was pretty easy. Well, Seth, just like every other coach, um, you have to have some players. <laughs> and and uh, there's several of his players out there. And Doug Cook when, and I were teammates. And Mike Malloy was on our team. And I think inch for inch, um, our senior, our junior year anyway, Mike was the best college player in the country except for that kid out in UCLA, Al Cinder or something, whatever his <laughs> name was. So we had, some, we had some players in that team. But you, the, the challenge here was to go back for 50 years and kind of condense what all I knew about and all the things we had together uh, and condense it down into a short conversation. So I went back to the beginning and, you know, I remember being a 17 year old senior in high school, seeing Coach Holland in my gym, he'd come to recruit me. What an honor that was. And um, I, I just, in, in doing this the process, I, I realized that he was 23 years old at the time. He was just a kid, you know, from what we, where we are today. But uh, I played four years for him. The freshman year was a great year. Uh, for two years, he was our assistant coach, and he became the head coach. When left, he went to, to Maryland. And um, we, we did so many things together. I, I played for him for four years. I wore his number, 42. Um, when, I, when I graduated, um, we even bought a house together with the Hollands. You don't buy a house together with somebody unless you trust them. And we bought the house it's on Lake Norm, it was $12,500. <laughs> we sold it a year later for $25,000. We thought we had this real estate thing, you know, we got it. <laughs> Four years later, he calls me and says, Jerry, remember the uh, lot across the cove from us? It just sold for $400,000. <laughs> Well, after I graduated, you know, he, he I, as uh, Dr. Kirkendall, sometimes I call him John. Um, when he, David, when uh, Terry went to Davidson, uh, excuse me, when he went to Virginia, came up here, he called me about joining his team, and it just didn't work out. He called me again when Kentucky called him, and our timing was not right. Again, when even again at Texas, when Texas was calling him to recruit, recruit him to come play be their uh, head coach. He called me and it didn't work out. But I'm here to say that um, quietly, he was a hot commodity in the coaching industry 40 years ago. They, people knew him, people knew what his potential was. So, uh, you know, you have to be proud of that. But I've just said three things in condensing 50 years. I need a smaller cheat sheet, I think. No, I don't have the hands anymore. But three things to say about Coach Holland. One, he was quiet. It, he was always that way. He never raised his voice to us. He never yelled at us. He never scolded us. Uh, not at timeouts, not in halftime. Never. He never raised his voice. And he did raise his voice a few times during ball games when he was addressing a referee about their level of competence having just made another bad call. He did that. <laughs> and you could see his competitiveness during that time just kind of poured out, poured out of him. It was out there for everybody to see. 
But he also had a sense of humor, um, and it was a subtle sense of humor. Um, our freshman team was pretty good. We scrimmaged the varsity every day. Most practices ended with several segments of 10-minute running clock. And we beat him four, five, six times in a row. And Coach Holland brought us over to the side, and he said, you know, Coach Dursell is going to keep us here until they win. <laughs> 11 minutes later, we were in the shower, so. <laughs> Leadership. Um, I, again, my freshman year, we were playing an away game. Late in the second half, maybe eight minutes to go. Um, Doug Cook had three fouls on him. Mike Malloy had three. I was in my normal spot sitting next to him with four fouls on the bench. And after a minute, he turns to me and he says, those guys may foul out too. Should we go to a zone? I'll tell you, I was stunned. I had never had a coach ask me what my opinion was. I was used to being told what to do. And here this guy was asking me, and I'm thinking, what is this? I said, the only sensible thing, I said, well, we've never practiced a zone, so it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> Coach Holland also had his own team at home. Ann was his support from the get-go. You've already met Ann Michael and Kate. And for 51 years, they went along and she followed him every place he went. She did everything he asked her to do. I'm not saying she liked it, but she followed him. And about five or six years ago, she realized she needed to become the captain of her team. And she looked around, finding a place for him. David's in Charlotte, Denver for a while. And she settled on Charlottesville. It was a great decision. But she asked me several times in phone conversations, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I kept telling her she would do the right thing, and she has done the right thing. And so, Ann, uh, you fought the scourge of Alzheimer's along with Terry, both publicly and privately. And all I can do is thank you on behalf of all the rest of us for being that person all those years. Now, I don't know whether she's, I don't know whether she's ever had a standing ovation, but I think now is the right time for that. Hundred percent. Fred Hetzel. You averaged twenty-five points a game and thirteen rebounds, and we're the Southern Conference Player of the Year three years in a row. First pick in the overall in the NBA draft to San Francisco, not the Golden State, or I guess to San Francisco again. Warriors. But the most important question is when and where did you first meet Coach Holland? Well, I met Terry uh, Holland and his roommate. Bill Bierman uh, on a recruiting trip uh, to Davidson College in 1961. Uh, it was another another time back then, and we enjoyed our weekend together, and we ended up talking about recruiting stories. And I found out that weekend that Terry had actually been very interested in attending Wake Forest. And Wake had a great basketball team at that time. Davidson, on the other hand, had never had a winning basketball team. And he was thinking seriously of joining up with Lynn Chapel and Billy Packer, who was my favorite player on that team, and Bones McKinney was the coach. Um, the trouble was when he would get home, he would end up talking with his mother and his mother would say, you know, a lot of people can get into Wake Forest, but very few can get into Davidson College. And then in the background, hanging around was a guy named Lefty Drussell. And Lefty was sitting back in the weeds with the keys to his car 
and he was waiting until the time was right to offer that car to Terry to borrow and take Ann to the prom. Well, it was all downhill after that. <laughs> in, in my situation, uh, I had always been interested in, in Duke University, and they, of course, had a terrific team with Player of the Year, Art Heyman. And, but the, the guy who I really enjoyed talking to the most was the assistant basketball coach, a guy named Bucky Waters. Bucky was a terrific recruiter. And he was completely eaten up with a high school player at that time who was going to be the high school player of the year from Crystal City, Missouri. And that guy's name was Bill Bradley. And I kept thinking after hearing all these stories that Bucky Waters would tell me about how this guy was going to be the next white Oscar Robertson. And I thought, you know, this would be pretty good to play with this guy. So I'm leaning in that direction until one day I opened up the Washington Post and in there was an article on Bill Bradley committing to go to Princeton University. And you know, it was only a short time thereafter that the phone rang and it was Lefty Drussell. And Lefty said, did you hear the news? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Bradley's going to Princeton. And Hetzel, he said, there isn't any hope that you're going to Princeton. Said, Your best chance is to come to the Princeton of the South. So that was the type of weekend that we had then. And both of us ended up committing probably the best decision that either one of us ever made at that point in our lives. We, we, we went ahead and committed to come to Davidson College and by, by Terry's senior year, he had been elected the captain of the basketball team and he began to promote the idea that we players should only take high percentage shots from the floor. And we gave it a try and actually what happened was Terry ended up leading the nation in field goal percentage. I mean, led the nation in field goal percentage. And the spillover to that was that our team actually set an NCAA record for field goal percentage and also led the nation. So that year we were 22 and four, Terry's senior year. And for the first time ever, Davidson College was polled in the AP and the UPI as a top 10 basketball team. Pretty good for a little school with an enrollment of less than a thousand students. Think about that for a minute. I don't think that it's ever been, it hadn't been done any before and I'm not sure it's ever been done again. So now when I, I know the, I, I, I think of the the other players that we played with and the pride that we take um, in knowing where the basketball program for Davidson is today and that we were the ones that laid the foundation for that program. And the people that Terry Holland coached in the 60s that also contributed to that situation, we take a lot of pride in that. So, I would say to Terry, thank you. It's an honor to have competed with you. It's an honor to have been your friend. And I hope that you rest in peace. Thank you. Coach Carlisle, taking good shots, not a bad idea. <laughs> Could have the East Carolina panel up. Are we doing the football players here? Uh, <laughs> well, you got another one behind you, though. He's got your back. I promise you that. Carl Lester Carpler, East Carolina Hall of Famer, 2002 North Carolina. 
Sports Hall of Fame with this guy named Terry Holland inducted in your same class. 2,800, wait a second, people got to know how good you are. 2,800 <laughs> yards as well, a running back. What did coach mean to you? Well, first of all, let me back up just a little bit um, because in the 60s, late 60s, when he was head coach at Davison, uh, I used to see him on TV, you know, my 25-inch RCA screen, you know, no color TV unless you put a little pink tint or red tint on it and call it color, but it was <laughs> still black and white. Uh, but the thing was, I had never met him. And I was enamored by him just being a coach on the sideline. In 2002, Coach Holland and I were inducted into the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. And that is when I got my first opportunity to meet him face to face. I went up to him in the North lobby of the North Raleigh Hilton and I said, Coach Holland, or Mr. Holland at the time, I never called him Terry, by the way, as well, because I mean, there are a lot of coaches behind me. There are some obviously in the uh, audience as well. And when I speak of him, when I say coach, it is with reverence and respect. And so to say what we usually don't say, call him by his uh, name was foreign to me. But I said, Mr. Holland, my name is Carlos de Crumpler. I've admired you from afar for quite a few years. It's a pleasure and an honor, sir, to have the opportunity to meet with you. Little did I know that two years later, he would become the athletic director at East Carolina University. And that is where our re relationship really began. So thank you, Ann and Michael, uh, for the opportunity to meet such a great individual that had such an impact on my life. Now, I work in academics and I still do. He and I probably have basically the same demeanor to, for the most part, quiet, perhaps a little unassuming, uh, just love people. Although my student athletes seem to think I'm a little intimidating uh, when they beat me and I like to carry that stern look, so good. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, he gave me an opportunity to be involved without being one of his, on his executive committee and administrative uh, group at East Carolina. And that was pretty special. And I didn't take that for granted uh, because, again, I admired him so much. I thought, well, I felt like I was just more of a sounding board uh, and a person that he was looking for or looking to for a perspective on whatever it is he was trying to do. And I'll make it very clear. We had a lot of conversations, but I didn't make any decisions. The decisions were all his. And they were all his because he was a man that could make a decision and not look back on it. And uh, that was critical and important. If you're gonna be a leader, that's what you're gonna have to do. You can't look left and right for everything, but it's always good to get perspective. And that's where I provided it. And um, it was not rocket science. Uh, I didn't, I would offer what I thought, but I would never tell him obviously what to do. Well, I couldn't tell him what to do, but he wouldn't got to probably listen anyway, but um, no, he would. But I am so blessed and so thankful to the Holland family for the opportunity that was allowed me to meet such a great man uh, throughout my life. And I've, I've had what I call four turning points in my life that made me go one direction or another that helped mold me into the individual that I am today. And what I've come to understand now is that that fifth one, Coach Holland, thank you. Skip Holtz, Coach Holland hired you in 2005 to basically rejuvenate the football program at East Carolina. And I know he had a vision and his kind of his mindset was you can't be the best unless you play the best. Yes. And he did an incredible job, obviously, with the schedule. And all you did was go to four consecutive bowl games and over two weekends in 2008 beat 
Virginia Tech and West Virginia and built a program that was rated as high as 14th in the country. But what did you learn from Coach Holland that you brought and memories of Coach Holland that you brought to the field to coach your team and also to your own family as you were parenting your two sons? Well, A, what an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, to move mountains, we play a football game tomorrow. And I wouldn't have missed this for anything in the world. Terry Holland meant that much to me. When he first hired me, I remember he talked about he liked to coach his kids because they get it. Um, I really didn't know what we got at that point, but we got it, I guess, <laughs> as a coach's child. Um, the longer I was around Coach Holland, um, they got tough love. As I'm sure many stories will come out about Coach as a, as a coach when some of his players start talking about him. Um, I didn't always like what he had to say, but he was always right. Um, he was a pioneer. He thought outside the box. Um, yes, his schedule, you said he did a great job for his schedule. When, when you're a football coach of a, power, a, a non-Power 5 school, and your four non-conference games are North Carolina, NC State, uh, West Virginia, and Virginia Tech every year. That certainly wasn't ideal. <laughs> but he talked about that was, it was his, his goal. It was his dream. It was how he was going to move mountains at East Carolina University. And the memories I have of Terry, um, yes, or some as a boss when we had won We'd won two games in three years before I got there. Um, we beat North Carolina. We beat NC State. You mentioned the Virginia Tech and West Virginia and ranked up to number 14th in the country. Uh, I think he was really proud when we beat Virginia 31-21. Not that I remember that day or anything, but I think he was really proud of that day when we beat Virginia on the gridiron. Um, we had two conference championships. We went to four bowl games in a row. And that wasn't, I don't say I, that was we, uh, what we did together. But the impact that he made on me wasn't of the success on the field. The impact he had on me was more um, as a man. Whether it was the um, night before a ball game, the Crown Royal nightcaps that we would sit and have, they always lasted longer when Ann was there. And there was always more of them, too. But from those nights of just sharing uh, thoughts, dreams, visions, uh, I learned a lot. Terry was a lot like a father to me. Um, from those days to the smile we see everywhere, the salute uh, on a win, to when we lose, on Sunday morning he would come into my office and bring a cup of coffee. And he would sit down. He probably had no idea what he was watching because it was football on the field, on the, on the video. But he wouldn't say a word. I would complain and bitch about officiating and uh, everything that went wrong in the game. And he was just there to support. And he changed me. Um, he made me a better husband. He made me a better father. He made me a better son. Um, how it affected the way I raised my children, quite a bit. And I have a son in coaching, football coach. I have a son that played basketball at Notre Dame, which is kind of outside the box for the Holtz family, um, <laughs> to play basketball. And I have a daughter who now works for the Seattle Seahawks, all in sports that grew up with their most formidable years being in Greenville, North Carolina with the Holland family. And um, I can never say thank you enough. So it is bittersweet that we're here. Um, obviously, we're all going to miss him. Uh, I hate it that he's gone. I used to enjoy the trips to figure eight, the fishing trips. I still outfished him every time we fished, as I remember it. But the times we spent together, I will miss him as a friend, um, somebody I admired, somebody I looked up to. So I thank the Holland family for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Val, come on up. Huh? Just you. <laughs> well, you have a long history. Val Ackerman, the former president of the WNBA, USA Basketball, first female thousand point scorer here at Virginia, two time academic All American, UCLA Law School grad. But in talking to you last week, you said one of the things that really stuck out to you about Coach Holland was in the late 1970s when Debbie Ryan took over as the basketball coach here at Virginia, uh, the support that Coach Holland gave the women's program really mean, meant the world to you and to the program's growth in general. What did you mean by that? Well, first I just want to uh, offer my thanks <clears throat> to Ann and Ann Michael and Kate. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this. Um, I had so much respect uh, and admiration for Coach Holland and just to be here today is, uh, is something I, I can't put it in words. So thank you very much for allowing me to be part of it. Um, you know, I was just sort of thinking, Seth, in answer to your question, there, you know, there are so many ways to talk about uh, a person's accomplishments and impact. And for me, um, when I think about Coach Holland, his impact on me, his legacy here at Virginia, um, obviously it has, you know, it was about building the foundation or being part of the foundation for the men's program. And you're gonna hear from colleagues of mine on the stage about, uh, about that. Um, I can tell you as a student here in the late 70s and the early 80s, what was happening with the men's program was, um, it was amazing. It was amazing to be here then, to see the excitement around the program, um, to see these great players coming through, many of them my friends, to see what that was doing for the university, um, to see what it was doing for the community. And there was Coach Holland in the middle of this, just leading with serenity and dignity um, and uh, you know, just sort of managing all of this. And, I just remember at the time thinking, this is an incredible leader. This is someone who, you know, you can learn from. Even if you're a 18 year old, you know, girl, you can learn from this man. And to answer your question, Seth, at that time, many know the women's program was just getting off the ground. I want to acknowledge Coach Ryan, who's here, for um, the amazing job that she did putting Virginia women's basketball on the map. Thank you. And I, want to, and I want to also acknowledge Jean Corrigan, and Mrs. Corrigan is here as well. I see her here because between Debbie and Mr. Corrigan and Coach Holland, we had an incredible leadership team in athletics here at UVA, and they really did make the, the progress of women's sports here possible. And I do remember, um, you know, Terry was, he was so supportive of the women's program. Um, at a time when that was probably more the exception than the rule for a men's basketball coach to be so caring about when we had practice, sharing the gym with us, um, staying around, watching our practices, coming to our games. I mean, the, report, the support was there in every way. He was, um, he was a, in support of gender equity, I would say, long before that came in vogue. And it was noticeable and it made a big difference. And just speaking as one of the players at that time, we'll, we'll be forever thankful to him for that. You also had a, another relationship with Coach when you were the president of the board of directors of USA Basketball. He was on your committee. And I always think of Coach as like an outside the box thinker. Can you think of some of the input that he had as you guys would come together and create a vision for USA Basketball? Well, let me, Seth, I want to give a little perspective on this because this to me goes to the impact of Terry beyond Virginia. We know what he did for Virginia men's basketball. I just gave you a glimpse of what he did for Virginia women's basketball. But he was also a very influential person in college athletics and college basketball writ large. And I had the opportunity to, um, to see that when I was associated with USA Basketball, I was on their board for many years. I had a chance to become the board chair during the 
05-08 quad where Team USA played in the China games. And I can tell you back in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, when USA basketball um, had to accept the NBA as a member because pro players could, for that point forward, play in the Olympics, it was a very interesting time for the Federation because up until that point, it had been run by college basketball executives. So think Dave Gavitt, think CM Newton, think Tom Jernstedt. They were at the helm and all of a sudden now the NBA comes into the picture. And it was just very interesting um, to sort of see how those two organizations had to come together in support of the national team program. And it really took just the right people for that collaboration to be successful. And that's where Terry came in. He was part of the uh, committee um, after Barcelona that chose the team that played in the Olympics in Atlanta. It had NBA executives as well as college executives on that committee. Terry, was he was perfect. He understood uh, what the NBA was looking for, but he also understood what the college game needed in order to stay connected to the national team program. He then became the chair of the collegiate committee, so he was in charge of... Uh, the junior national team program and the players and the coaches that got to be stay connected there. And then Seth, to your question, when I was had the honor of being elected chair of USA Basketball, Terry was on our board. And so, um, and you may remember Jim Delaney and Tom Jernstedt were also committee members. And I, I would say Terry had a broad view of the game. He was very much a steward of the game of basketball. He cared about it deeply. He cared about the pathway for young players. We were starting at that time to talk about some ways to get USA Basketball more involved in youth basketball. Some of the ideas were a little bit radical, but that didn't bother Terry. He was a big thinker, um, and he was supportive of ideas that we had then, which are coming into fruition today. But he was a wonderful colleague, um, somebody that I always looked up to, had great affection for, have seen Ann and Terry at so many events over the years. Think of you really, Ann, as one person. Uh, I really, really do. And um, my heart goes out to you and your family. And just know you can talk about accomplishment, but you can also talk about impact. Terry had both, but the impact was greater. So thank you very much for giving him to us. We're going to have the coaches panel come forward. We'll start with you, Cal. John Cal Parry, three different teams to the Final Four, National Championship, Hall of Fame. I know one of the teams went four times. I know I didn't miss that. Uh, but you and I would talk after you'd be in meetings uh, with Conference USA when Coach Holland was the athletic director at East Carolina. And you'd always say the same thing to me. Coach Holland, he's unbelievable. He's ahead of his time. That guy thinks so far out the box, outside the box. Way outside the box. It's mind-boggling. Explain yourself. Let me, first of all, Ann, thank you. Um, this is an honor for me to get to be here. Uh, Kate and Michael, thank you. Um, he, here in Virginia, in the early 80s, he was working with sports psychologists. Bob Rotella, what? It's all we talk about now. He did it in the early 80s. Because of him, I've worked with Bob Rotella since the early 90s because I said, what is he doing? And I'm at UMass and we're struggling. We brought in Bob Rotella, who's still a great friend. I think he worked with me more than the players, but that's another thing. You need more help than the players. <laughs> but, you know, what he did in the league meetings, he led. He had a it was like a professor, but he came up with stuff. Folks, let's play the tournament before the season. Like conference tournament, let's do it. I've been now saying it in the SEC for four years. Let's do it. 
let's get these games done. And at the end of the year, we don't have to play three games in three days and go on to the tournament. He also said, let's play two games at one place. And I'd say, coach, explain what you're saying. We'll play Saturday and Sunday at two games, back to back. And I, I don't really get what you're saying. You would come to East Carolina and you'd play us on Saturday and Sunday. I said, that was probably what you're trying to get to. But when we <laughs> went through COVID, that's what people were doing. He said it would save money, it would save class time. I could go on and on with what he did and then you look back and say, like he was way ahead. But for the family class, he was a good man. He was a good man. Some people climb the ladder of success and they turn around and they pick up the ladder. He climbed it as a player, as a coach, as a, an AD, committee member with Val. And he climbed that same ladder and his goal was to pick up the next person and to pick up the next person. And that's what he did for me. You may look and say, where, well, how? I, and I don't know, but you treated me like family. And, and we were his smile, her smile. And Val, you're right. There was coach and Ann. There was never coach. There was both. Um, I just say to all of you, how blessed were we to have him in our lives? And for all of us, his legacy and hopefully all of us, our legacy becomes who we've touched and who we've helped. And you guys help, have helped me in my career and as a person. Um, I love you guys all and I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Coach Ruffin McNeil, in 2010, Coach Holland won with the Board of Trustees. Coach Holland basically named you the head football coach at your alma mater, East Carolina. What was the historical and personal significance to you, and obviously the historical significance for maybe East Carolina and the profession at that time. No, uh, thank you, Coach. Uh, first, I want, like everyone else, Miss Ann and Michael, Kate, thank you all for inviting Arlene and I up. We're looking forward to it. I'm up on the stage with these stars. I'm, it was the peon lighting me up here with these. Thank you. Appreciate you putting up here with these guys. Uh, but I'm just honored to be here. I mean that too, Coach, and I mean that too, Coach. But. Uh, uh, Coach and I first were, he always, I don't know if people know, Coach was a really good football player too. You can ask Ann. Played wide receiver, Clinton Dark Horses. We never beat them turkeys in football, <laughs> ever. Uh, and I went to London High School, so we were first, we had a little background that way. Uh, but uh, coaching is all I know. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a coach's kid as well. Uh, I know, early in, I know what, exactly what you went through, because I gained my dad in November 6th with the same deal. We gained Coach Holland. We didn't lose him. How you deal with it? We gained him. We gained Angel. We gained coaches. He's going to take care of all of us now. The referees are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know it yet, but they are. I believe that to my core. We didn't lose. We gained an angel. We gained angels. And, uh, I know that for a fact, having to work with him, just like Coach Cal said and everyone else has mentioned. I had to, in coaching, you want to not be the man that follows the man that follows the man. You want to be the man that follows the man after the man who followed the man. Well, I had to follow Coach Holt. He had just won championships, bowl games. I'm going, okay. I didn't know it at the time I was going to be there. So the story sort of goes like this a little bit, Coach. I, I was at Texas Tech for 10 years, worked for the late Mike Leach. Uh, taking over for Texas Tech at the year 10 at the Alamo Bowl. Coach Leach got suspended. I had to take over for him as a head coach. I had played East Carolina, of course, and all that, but that game was, a, was one of the most watched games on ESPN football-wise. Also that day, 
Skip and the East Carolina Pirates played in Liberty Bowl. We played at Allen Bowl, Allen Bowl that night. So we got a chance to be on the TV at the same time, not knowing what was going to happen. Had no idea. Uh, we win the game, as coaches know. We thought we had the job. We thought we could get out. We won the game. Erlene, we're fine. We're going to be the next head coach and first lady at Texas Tech. Didn't happen. One of the most challenging times in my entire life. Challenging times. And I'm a pretty tough hombre. Uh, but it was challenging. So I meet Skip. Me, Skip and I have known each other a long time. I'm in the airport and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to get back busy with it. I'm going to get interviewing jobs. So I had gone to Stanford, Jim Harbaugh, accepted the job. So I called Arlene, my better three force. First time I ever called her and said, we're taking the job. Instead of asking her, can we take the job? May, may I take the job? But so I, I take the job at Stanford and was flying back from that job uh, to take it. Going back to Lubbock, Texas. We stopped in a, I got uh, a delay in Continental, uh, Houston Continental. Got a phone call uh, about interviewing for the particular East kind of job. Coach Hosey just left. And uh, I'm going, well, if you're serious, I interview for it, but I just took a job at Stanford. Erlene's cleared it, okayed it, just like Miss Ann did for Coach Holland. Let's don't get it twisted. And uh, so I'm going there, but if you're serious, we'll interview for it. So th they called back that Wednesday, and uh, Coach said, okay, so we flew out to Greenville, and uh, we did the interview. Here's, here's, here's getting out to the, to the historical part we talked about. Well, I interviewed at Texas Tech for the head job and those. I had a nice little packet made up with notes and questions. We all know what I'm talking about when of uh, what to answer and how to present myself, philosophy to the Board of Trustees, which Carlos Crump was on, but also Coach Holland in that room. And uh, I was all set to open that page up, and I didn't open it up one single time in that, in that interview process. Coach Holland stood at the end of the table and listened to every word I said. I know he did, because he had to make a tough hire. It was the guy that was following a very successful coach and a great coach and a great family and a great friend. And uh, so I just, I think I did all right in the interview. And uh, but I looked down at the coach and coach is a little bit emotional. I'm saying, did I mess this up already? <laughs> then no. So we go back to the hotel and finally get a call that we, 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 we got the job in East Carolina. By the way, I know it's most because Miss Holland, Miss Ann had to do the the first day of uh, presenting the, at the interview when I was announced to the these kind of people. Miss Ann read all that. The historical fact about we'll get to the question, uh, and we're all here. We all, Coach Holland, outside the box, I've heard that a bunch. Never called him Terry. Never in my life would not call him. He's Coach Holland. Coach Holland. Made a hire at East Carolina. Yeah, I'm a former player. He made the historical hire. I was the first African American head coach in East Carolina history ever in any sport. Outside the box? <laughs> he, yeah. And that, that confidence he displayed, and he didn't look at it like that. Neither did I. I looked at getting hired and get a chance to learn from one of the greatest ever did, who's ever done it for us. And he was there, thick and thin for me. And uh, I, I wish I could have had him the whole, entire time of my tenure there. I learned so much from his stalwart place, how he held his, held his just grace. And, and, and it's just so smart and outside the box is the correct word, but also sincerity and love. And I can tell the, the children, and Miss Ann, you know, and the girls, y'all y'all know, man, he was great, one of the greatest men I've ever met in my life. I met a lot of them. This is year 44 coaching for me. One of the greatest men I've ever met in my life. Early and I are proud to have met him. And if you see me crying up here, it is not tears. Coaches don't cry, their eyeballs sweat. <laughs> so if you say I'm, I, I've cried, I'm gonna I'm find you, so my eyeballs may be sweating, but, uh, 
I thank your child for that. And thank you for having me up here, Ann. Love y'all. So, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a interject something. You crushed it at East Carolina. I mean, second most wins in the history of the school, smacked around Carolina and State, multiple bowl games. You crushed it at, at East Carolina. They were fortunate to have you. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Jim Laranaga. This is going to be good right here now. <laughs> I mean, you spent two different terms with Coach Allen, once at Davidson, once obviously here at Virginia, part of staff of two Final Fours. But you didn't do too bad on your own either, by the way. Multiple ACC Coach of the Year. Multiple times CA Coach of the Year. Took another Virginia school to a Final Four. But when I think you, I got to be honest with you. Besides calling you Murdoch, which is an inside joke, when I think of you, I think of Coach Holland. What, those two different stints, how did that become where you worked with Coach Holland at Davidson, took a little hiatus, and then came back to be by his side here in Virginia? Well, let me begin by saying this. My wife and I got married. We were 21 years old. We're both from the Bronx. Uh, really? We got back from our honeymoon and I got a phone call from Terry Holland. Jimmy, this is Terry Holland, the head coach of Davidson College. I would like to interview you for an assistant coaching job. I'm like, wow, I'd be honored. We're gonna fly you down. So my wife and I flew down to, to Charlotte. Ann and Terry picked us up at the Charlotte airport, gave us a tour of Davidson College. We went around all day, beautiful, beautiful school, loved it. And at the end of the day, I just asked Coach Holland, uh, Coach Holland, what hotel are we staying at? Oh, no, 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 you're not staying in a hotel. You're staying at our house. Right, Andy, you remember? And then he says, Ann and I are going to stay at our lake house, and you and Liz can sleep in our bed. <laughs> I said, you think out of the box? <laughs> I, I'm trying to is this guy weird or what? <laughs> so we packed our bags, and we went to Davidson, and we loved it. And three years later, after Coach Holland had won four consecutive Southern Conference Championships, he gets a call from Gene Corrigan, the athletic director at UVA. And Terry accepts the job. And then he says to me, Jimmy, you want to go to Virginia? I said, heck no, Virginia stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all did, you stuck at that time. So Terry, Terry, Terry takes the job and starts building the program. I go on my journey and five years later, he calls me again. Jimmy, I want you to be my assistant. I said, T, thanks, but I'm a Division II head coach, and I like being a head coach. He said, no, you're coming here. I'm sending a private jet to pick you up and fly you down here. I said, you're sending what? <laughs> that was it. We packed our bags, and we moved to Charlottesville and became, I mean, just unbelievable. June, June 1st, 1979, Ralph Sampson commits to the University of Virginia, and everything changed. Ralph was joining the great Kentucky foursome, Jeff Lamp, Lee Raker, Jeff Jones, and Terry Gates, and a host of other great players. And for the next 10 years, were the dominant team in college basketball. Terry won, went to the, the Final Four twice, went to the Elite Eight twice, went to the Sweet 16, won three ACC regular season champions championships. The guy was awesome. I had the opportunity and the good fortune of just going for the ride and having a great, great time. All right. Terry, I mean, the assistant coaches who have worked for Terry know it. We became a part of his family. He treated us like family and his family. They were a major part of the team. We were all in this together. All right. And I loved every Every minute of it, all right? Annie, Kate, and Michael, you know what a big part you were of the, the University of Virginia basketball program, all the things we did, all the meals we had together. And from, from an assistant coach's standpoint, all the coaches and all the players, when you're treated like family, you really feel a part of the program. 
So all I want to say, and I know everybody will agree with me, uh, T, you were the greatest. And I know everybody here loves you. And no one will ever forget the impact you had on all our lives. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. They're going to do some housekeeping here while I talk. Multitasking. Probably a lot of you are wondering, like this guy was only in Virginia for eight months. What is he doing here? And then he went and worked for that place up the road for nine years. Maybe you should talk about Frank Beamer or something. But uh, in 1983, I was let go at the University of Pittsburgh as an assistant coach. And I was kind of in coaching purgatory. And because Coach Odom, where's Coach Odom? Right there. Um, and the bean back here, Mark Averoni, who I got to know Coach Hong through Mark when he was recruiting Mark Averoni. But a lot of hard work from Coach Odom. Coach Holland brought me here to Virginia as a graduate assistant. Now I have one disclosure. I was the worst graduate student in the history of the University of Virginia. And I really apologize for devaluing your degree. But it was only eight months, so maybe they'll forget about it. But uh, I thought I was coming here to kind of get a master's in coaching. I mean, working with Coach Laranega, Coach Odom, obviously the big whistle, Coach Holland. And I did. I mean, what a magical ride. I don't know exactly what I did with the ride, but maybe the most improbable ride to a Final Four, that 84 team, probably one of the most improbable in the history of college basketball. But from that point forward to the rest of my life, from that point forward, every major decision I ever made, I consulted Coach Holland. Now, he never told me what to do, but he advised me and gave me insight. When I say every major decision, I include asking my wife to marry me. Because the next summer after he helped me get the University of Miami job, Miss Holland and the Odoms, they invited us to Ocean Reef for a little weekend vacation. And at the end of that weekend, Coach Holland calls me in to like this hallway. And my wife of 38 years now, she was somewhere in the kitchen. Miss Holland's standing here, coach is standing here, and Coach Holland says, she's the one. And only as Mrs. Holland could do, she said, Berg, don't screw it up. <laughs> and that's a true story. That's the only time he told me what to do. He always advised me what to do. And every major decision, he was available 24-7. When, when I decided to leave Miami and take the assistant job at Long Beach State, it was a midnight call. And he was there for me. Real simply, he changed my life. I have no idea where I'd be today or what I'd be doing or what my family would look like without him investing in me. And, and, and it was a great lesson for me that everyone needs a mentor. Everyone needs someone to invest in them while asking nothing in return. And that's what Coach Holland did for me for 39 years. The only time he ever basically gave me bad information now, full disclosure, Ms. Holland, because you're part of the story as well, was we were playing at Duke my second year in the ACC. And if you remember that game, with 1.2 seconds left, although we were playing at Duke, so they made it 1.9 seconds, <laughs> we were up one. And they called a timeout, and Sean Dockery makes a half-court shot. And uh, Ryan, you were on that staff. And I never took my phone into the arena when we were playing on the road. I'd just leave it in the bus. 
So you coach, Ben, and that's before we chart, you guys chart it. We bust everywhere. But so I get back into the, I get back into the, the bus and I'm distraught, understatement. Not that I've really been even keeled in my life, but I sit down and I look at, down at my phone. And this is not embellished at all. And it says, missed call, big whistle, voice message. So I figured, I was kind of miserable. I figured I'm going to hit this voice message and Coach Hollins going to give me this uplifting message like he always did, maybe after a tough loss or if we were struggling a little bit, I, he'd pick up the phone and call me and talk me through me having out-of-body experiences. And so I hit the button, and here's the message, almost verbatim. Berg, unbelievable. You just went into Cameron Indoor Stadium, and then I hear Mrs. Holland in the background going, Terry, oh no! <laughs> That's when the shot went in. It's a true story. And all he said then was, Berg, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and to be honest with you, it still gave me what I needed in that moment in time. It gave me a perspective, perspective. And that's what for, I'm gonna hang in here, <laughs> 37 years, that's what Terry Howell gave me. He gave me a life, he gave me perspective. And Michael, Kate, Ms. Holland, I thank you. Thank you. All right. Now that I can breathe, um, my job is to introduce Ralph Sampson. Guys, anyone know him? You know, everyone thinks of Ralph and they think of three time Naismith Award winner, two time Wooden Trophy, uh, three time ACC Coach of the, uh, Player of the Year. Final Fours, Elite Eights, first round of the NBA draft, rookie of the year. And that's great, but like what I think of is, and one of the all-time greatest players in the history of college basketball here at the University of Virginia. And I think of as, well, why did he come to Virginia? And he came to Virginia because of people, relationships, and trust. He came to Virginia when he was the number one player in the country coming out of high school because of family, because of belief, because he felt Coach Holland was the right person to coach him, that would invest in him. And as coaches, and we all know this, when you recruit, coaching is about family. Coaching isn't about the four years you coach someone. Coaching is about the 40 years after you coach someone. And I think that was the magic of Coach Holland, and that was the magic of the relationship that he had with Ralph. You know, Ralph Sampson is all what's, and the relationship you have with Coach Holland is all what's right in college coaching. You know, at the end of it, he's a big brother to Ann Michael and Kate, he's an uncle to Holland Shark and Liza Gray, and he's family. Ralph Sampson. So I get the lovely pleasure of bringing some teammates and some players up, and we'll have a little fun with these guys. While you guys are coming up, I like that. I don't want to miss anybody, you know, whatever. So if you ever played here at Virginia or with Coach on stand up, because I know it's a lot more guys out there, but I don't want to miss anybody. But stand up real quick while these guys are coming up. Give them a hand, give you a hand. But these are all the guys that played here and under Coach Holland and ministry, whatever they did. Thank you guys for being here. It's very special. Very, very special. Stay standing for a second, please. I know we got um, uh, some administrators, Coach Page, Coach Odom, stand up, please. Coach Odom, I see you back there trying to slide down your seat, but you got to get up. Just call people out. 
I see Teresa Renault back there and love her. She's friends, her husband. Uh, we go way back as well. And then all you other guys out there, all the other schools as well. So you guys can sit down now and thank you. Um, and, you know, it's an honor that um, I'm here. And actually, you know, I'm going to do this before we get started because it's in my heart right now. So, uh, as two other guys would have, I know at least one would have been here before. A lovely Ken Neeland that passed away, one of the players here over the year. And uh, we just lost a guy named Lance Blanks uh, a couple of days ago as this we started. And they would be here. Jeff Klein is one of the guys that I'm sure would have been around as well. So we will definitely, uh, uh, Coach Allen has three players up there with him. They can coach still and uh, let them uh, run the steps in U-Haul, whatever they got up there, right? They'll figure it out. So it's good. So I guess I have to stand here because the mic, whatever. But when I, when I came to UVA, I was, you know, uh, and I don't know Coach Cal left, but when I went to Kentucky and, um, and uh, took my official visit, I had a coach named Leonard Hamilton, great coach at um, Florida State, and they picked me up, and uh, coach, coach Bennett, they had two FBI escorts take me from Harrisonburg on the plane. My mom's sitting there laughing because she remembers it. Fly me to Kentucky in the Wildcat Lodge, and it was the best thing ever. And I get there like, I'm coming to Kentucky. Uh, you know, my job at Kentucky would have been turn the water on for the horses, go work out, come back, turn the water off. Now, I don't know how much they would have been paid, but they had those type of jobs in Kentucky, as, as Coach Cal probably knows already as well. He, he, I can talk about it now he's gone. My mother and father said, well, you know, let's just wait a minute and digest it and uh, figure it out and then uh, so forth and so on. So my official visit here, and I, I went to say, say titles. I've been over here in class, but I don't need to come to UVA and take an official visit. And Coach Allen said, you need to take an official visit. So I did, and they picked me up in a van in Harrisonburg. Coach Page remembers, and they had some uh, Dunkin' Donuts and some hot chocolate, whatever, in the van. Okay, great. We drive over, we get to University Hall, and there's this helicopter in the field. I'm like, okay, I'm not getting on that. Who's getting on that? I know my mom and dad were gonna get on that as well, but whatever, but I never been in a helicopter, and when you go up, you lean, like, oh, I'm gonna fall out. So I get up, and obviously, um, Tom Hicks and some crazy attorney brothers. Now, if you remember U-Haul, it was kind of a, I mean, I would never went on the, I mean, none of you guys would never went on top of that building. But they did, they painted Ralph's house on it, so that's the way that happened. I didn't know it for a while until over the number of years. But I came here, and my official visit was the same weekend as my mother's birthday, April 13th. And I remember that like it was like yesterday, right? And then when we did the national championship, and we had the parade in Scott Stadium, it was the same weekend as when I took my official visit here. 40 years later. So it's kind of deja vu for me and it helped me a lot. But anyway, we'll get started. But I was saying, I, 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 I announced I was coming. I was 7'1", about 195 pounds. And this family kind of adopted me because they was ordered by Coach Harlan, talking about how innovative he was, to put weight on me. It didn't work. <laughs> So we got Mr. Lucky Gray's up here, uh, Gray's family, Mountain Lodge, great, great people. We would go to ACC tournaments, everybody knows the stories. And they had this big Winnebago with food. And they would just feed us food and say, you gotta eat all you can eat. But anyway, Lucky Gray's here. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Gray's is in the audience. Uh, so I know they are, are smiling as well, but they're right, sitting right there. Right He's laughing because he did his job. He, he, he was still trying to feed me today. Like, we got some jam in the car. We got some in the car. But, you know, like your, your family became like a teammate, part of the family. What are some of your experiences there? Uh, there used to be basketball camps. It's been going on. But what are your experiences there with Coach Holland, UVA, and the family? Yeah, that's how it all got started with basketball camp. I was eight years old when Coach Holland first came into our lives and um, it was a blessing uh, to see a man like that that even as a little kid you know you're looking way up to a person like that that's a head basketball coach somewhere at UVA and he just talks to you like you're just a person not a little kid not a grown up or anything like that just as a person. And that was, you know, Coach Holland all his life, that's the way he was. And um, 
some of the memories up there. I used to have to work uh, the camp uh, store there, and Coach Holland would always come by and check on you. I mean, Coach Holland always at camp would just talk to everybody, not, you know, not hesitate. If a kid was having a problem, he would go take care of it. He didn't send a counselor to go take care of it. I mean, he made sure that those kids were taken care of. And in all my memories, that's what I always saw in Coach Holland. If there was a problem, he would go take care of it, not send other people to go do it. And he just was a great man. And a couple of other things that we do have, I know Ann, I do call her Ann, but I don't call, I call Coach, Coach. But anyway, one, I know one summer we had some sweet corn up there. And I don't know who it was, but when we came out to the table, we brought several platters of sweet corn out there and they were all, all of them had been eaten. So I thought, you know, they might need some more. And uh, Coach Holland said, I think Ann needs some more because those are all hers. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah. But, um, you know, and just him coming up there, um, I think he liked having kids up there. They felt, you know, more free because, you know, back then they definitely didn't have internet or anything like that. But they were also out in the boonies where they were kind of scared to go anywhere too. So you didn't have to worry about them running off when it got dark. Um, so they did have a good time. And um, I just, I know they used to have what they call bridge night up there at camp. I know some of y'all guys know what bridge night is. Because I think some of y'all got taken to the bridge before. But anyway, no, I'm just very honored to be up here. I, I, I just, you know, I'm going to miss them. And thank y'all for having me. Now you have to understand, thank you. Understand the, the basketball camp within a barn <laughs> with a paved floor and with markings. So it went to the floor like you know I'm used to, right? So you gotta give me a little flavor there. Everybody, we all been there. And we I think we try to play games there on the basket. It was tied to the side of a tin building. But give them that flavor of the camp a little bit more because it wasn't a, it wasn't yeah. twenty minutes basketball it, camp. No, it, it was not like a basketball camp saw today. We had an outside basketball court that was blacktop. We had an indoor basketball court in a barn. In a barn, a metal building with blacktop on that. So when you hit the ground, you knew that you were going to come up bleeding. It wasn't. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a scrape. You are going to be bleeding. So, yeah, and so it was, you know, kind of back to basics up there um, with basketball camp, and I think everybody really loved it. I had a guy that came by the store a few days ago and brought some pictures of Coach Holland and, and um, when he was at camp, and it was just pretty cool. Thank you, thank you. We will shift to, yeah, thanks so much. It was good. You know, before Coach Allen got here, you know, as um, Coach Larenega said, they weren't pretty good. They weren't good at all back in the day, whatever. They had not won a lot of games. And then uh, we heard a story even last night that um, I think Wally was telling us as well and Mark a little bit about uh, they were old for something. And, I mean, this was bad before he got here. And then when he was here the first year, he got a little bit better. But in the second year, uh, they get a couple of good players. And we all call him Wally Wonder and I run that crew and Bobby Stokes and all that crew as well. But going to Wally, you know, in, in this building and, and I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we got the Wally Walker Hall of Fame upstairs. So thanks for all that. And uh, we, we need to get a special place for Coach Holland in that Hall of Fame. And I guarantee we will do that in, in some way, shape or form. So thank you for that as well. Uh, that'll be something to, to cherish uh, as we go down the road. Uh, but Wally, what are your impressions of Coach Hollins when you, in your first year? Because, you know, you was, you know, uh, the, one of the first to turn it around a little bit. Oh, no, give, give Rick, somebody else a microphone. Hello, hello, hello. This one works. 
Great. Is it me? Can you hear me? Okay. And Katie and Michael, thanks for having me here. It's, it's such an honor to pay tribute to, to our coach. So in 1974, Coach Holland gets the job. And of course, we returning players are trying to figure out who is this guy. And he was only 10 years removed from being a college player himself. Dave was in class of 64. So he, so he comes up here in, in that spring, and he's in good shape, and sometimes we didn't have enough guys to play in a run, and he'd jump in and play with us. So we're, we're checking him out and trying to figure, you know, learn, again, more about him. And here are a couple things we learned early on. One, when his team lost a pickup game, he was really upset, got really upset. And two, in competitive heat, when he was playing those pickup games, he might just give you a little shot just because. <laughs> in that regard, he reminded us of Mark Ivoroni. <laughs> <laughs> but he also used to tell us some jokes that were, would be considered inappropriate, at least by today's standards, and actually were probably inappropriate even by 1974 standards. <laughs> we loved it. He was a little older, he was the head coach, but on some level we thought he was maybe like one of us, one, one of the guys. Then we got to practice in preseason condition in the fall. He was not one of the guys. <laughs> he was the head coach in full. He decided and knew he had to change the culture of the, pro, uh, the University of Virginia basketball program. And evidently decided the way to do that was to break us down physically. Yeah, we had a preseason conditioning program. It was the hardest thing that any of us have gone through. It just was. So you know, we talked a little bit earlier about load management. That's the term now of players. Well, I think Coach Holland thought it was load compounding or we were loads that had to be managed because he worked this. But he did change the culture. Mostly it worked because it didn't take root right away, but we got better. And we, got, we were competitive and we were gritty. And by the way, as we were gritty, no one liked playing against us. Tony, does any of that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next year, we did something. He set the, raised the level of expectations. Uh, he had changed the culture. He planted a seed that we could win. We could be league champions. He did that the year before when we weren't very good, to Rob's point. So it hasn't been said often enough, but when we did win the ACC championship that next year, we beat three ranked teams in three nights, two in the top eight. There was that. Uh, but do we out-talent anyone? No. We were more disciplined. We out-executed them. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's longhand for he out-coached them. He was still a young man, but he was the man and, and a great man. So I was here February 28th. It was a Clemson game. It turned out to be a big game. It was two days after coach passed. And uh, I visited with Jim Ryan at halftime of the game, President Ryan. He of April Pool Fool's Day prank fame. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Just take my word. So I asked him when we, when we talked at halftime, had he got a no coach? And he said, well, I met him, but I, I, I can't say I really knew him, but I'm reading all these tributes. And there's a thread, there's a theme that, that's, that's come through. And that thread is, you know, he was so generous with his time and his spirit to everybody, treated everyone well, with respect. He uplifted everybody. He made them feel good about the interaction. I said, yeah, you got it. That, that's who he was. And then uh, President Ryan used a quote that I'm familiar with, and in fact, my kids would tell you I, I overuse. And it's this, from the wisdom of Maya Angelou, which, which is being redundant, by the way. Uh, it's, they'll forget what you said, as you will today with me. They'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah, that, that's wise. So I, I, I've had this vision, and I, I still kind of have it today. I, I'd like to share it here. It, it's Coach, you know, he, he, he's watching. And Jeff Jones actually did a good impersonation of his smirk back, back in the locker room before. He, he's got that smirk because he's figuring out how he's going to prank all of us. Because he was a prankster of the goofiest, silliest type. And he's also thinking to himself, what are you all doing here? It's a beautiful spring afternoon in Charlottesville, Virginia, and you're inside a building. That, you know, it's a beautiful arena, which, by the way, this arena would not be here without him. Yeah. yeah. And also led to a beautiful program. Thank you, Coach. So uh, I, I'm here to respond to what I envision his asking why we're here. And it's this. 
Coach, we're, we're here because of the way you made us feel, and we'll never forget. And, 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 and Raleigh, I believe in that uh, ACC run championship. The year before, the NCAA changed the rules that, you know, if you won ACC, you went to the NCAA, and nobody else could go around the country, and they changed it. And then Maryland, no bums up there, other schools got in. That, wasn't that correct? Well, it used to be just the ACC tournament champion that got to go to the NCAA. It right. didn't matter what you did in the regular season, but they allowed more than one team to go. So, uh, Lefty Drysell, when we're playing North Carolina in the final, because we beat Maryland in the semis, was quoted as saying, and a lot of you know the Lefty and remember him, said it would be the first time in my life I would cheer for Carolina. Right. He wanted Carolina to beat us, because we obviously First time ever only. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll go back to Lefty, and uh, Lefty, the, the great coach of Maryland, whatever, but you can imagine me being recruited, and I'm getting ready to announce I'm going to Virginia, and Lefty was outside the door of my, my uh, high school gym saying, don't go to Virginia, don't go to Virginia. <laughs> Too late, Lefty. It's not a bad deal. <laughs> so we're next to Mr. Mark Averoni. So Mark is, uh, we go way back. He, Coach Holland and uh, Coach Cal would say he was very innovative. So Mark was a JV coach, Coach Ken Neal and the whole deal, whatever. But they say, Mark, come on and play. And then he had this idea with a guy named Lewis Collins as well, whatever. So Mark came and was there to beat me up every day uh, and play against us every day, whatever. But we, we had fun and enjoyed it. And relationships over the years have been uh, tremendous. So what was your relationship that you could share the most, like, rememberable qualities or, you know, and, 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 and Mark is somewhat like Coach Allen. Coach Allen was a prankster. I think Coach Bay can attest to this because her story is about when Coach Bay was there and you got your furniture changed in your, in your room and it was if someone was in the bathroom, it took you a couple weeks to uh, do it and they didn't know who it was, but it's probably Coach Allen. And one time he jumped out with a gorilla suit somewhere against somebody. So I hear all these stories, but Mark's got a little bit of that in him as well. But what are some of your memories and redeeming ideas? Because I know you got some over there. Respond. I'm not going to respond to all of that, but um, I just want to thank uh, all the support people here today who are in the shadows who made this tribute possible. You know, it, we wouldn't be here if they didn't take time out of their day on a beautiful day to, to be here. And I want to thank them. Um, obviously, I, I want to thank uh, Ann and Kate and Ann Michael for sharing your coach with all of us. Um, you know, again, family is a word used a lot in the basketball culture. It's it's not overused in this case. And we have such a wonderful personal relationship. That's what I'll cherish the most. Um, on that note, I was uh, airing out some old iPhone that I use as a backup. And uh, I had to use it because I cracked my, my, my good iPhone. And on it were some old messages. And I go back to 2019, it was May 6th. And it was right after the implosion of U-Haul party that Ralph threw for us out on West Main. And there was Coach Holland's voice, soothing and calm and helpful. <laughs> Is there anything we can do for you, Mark? We love your family and we wish you all the success. And you know, went on for about a minute and a half and, and, and here I am, this is three weeks ago and I don't know this is there even. And I'm just like, I don't believe it. I'm going to keep this phone. No one can take this phone from me. Well, he called back 30 seconds later. This is in 2019. And it was, ooh, I, I think I called you. I think I, I, think I butt called you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, like most people, or people included here on the panel would say, uh, yeah, sorry about that. See you. Bye. He was like, you know we love you, Mark. You're very special to us. <laughs> Your whole family, we wish you so much success. And you know, it wasn't a direct repeat, but the, you know, the, the best parts of him were coming out in 2019, and I will never erase that message either. And I thank you so much for sharing him with us. You know, now that voice was not the voice that I would hear in practice. <laughs> it was firm. And we all needed toughening, to Wally's point. Um, I was 205 pounds, and I was 6'8", and I was going to play against Tree Rollins and Owen Brown and uh, Ed Stahl and Mitch Kupchak. And he said I was going to play center. And so uh, we went up to Penn, 
And uh, they were Ivy League champions that year, and I got my butt kicked so bad that I knew there were doubts in the room uh, about me. But like Wally said, he taught me how to be physical, and that was the best thing for my career. It was the best thing that he helped me with on the court. And sometimes I'd get a little hot-headed and I'd get a little out of control. And I remember one of those times where I was just so fired up about something that happened inside or on the court or uh, one of the coaches were making a bad call against my team in the scrimmage. And good old coach Mike Shuler, rest in peace, he came up to me just to kind of calm me down and he touched me on the arm and I whipped around and I just said, don't touch me. I was obviously out of control. Yeah. And Coach Holland, all he said was, start running. <laughs> and I had to run laps. Yeah. And he told me when to come down. And it wasn't until after practice. So, you know, he, he had that way of assuring you and giving you confidence, but it was going to be through hard work. And again, like all the guys know here, some of those drills were ridiculous. Andrew Benini was telling about how he had to home, come home and just get in the ice bath. And this is in 1974. We didn't, who knew about ice baths? But I had a dream of playing in the ACC, but I, there was no way I could have dreamt that, thanks to Wally and, and all of my teammates, that we would win an ACC tournament. There was no way I could have even dreamt that. And years later, I'm, I'm trying to do the next level. I've, I've got a, literally, I'm dreaming about playing in the NBA, but I'm getting cut, and I'm not good enough. And I get cut on the last day by the Knicks. And I'm like, I have no idea what I want to do. I just want to get in my van and drive west and go to a park. I don't know. And he's the first one to call me. And he says, what are you doing? Why don't you come down here? And I said, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds like a good option. I had none. But to be around, he said, coach the JV. Well, I coached the JV for a couple of weeks. And on the second day of practice, a guy named Ken Needlin, rest in peace, came up to me and he said, Coach, I'm sorry, I had to go to class. Can I, uh, can I try out today? And the guy who was the center at the time after one day of practice had thrown up at the bottom of the steps after one half of Terry Holland's drills that he taught me. And I said, please, you're on the team. And you know, Kenton was, was special. He was a very special person. He'll always be to all of us as a person, as well as a, a basketball player who got Terry to his second Final Four. Well, two weeks later, I'm practicing with the varsity. And contrary to what Ralph said, Ralph kicked my butt every day in practice. And if there were any high elbows going, it were his. Look at his height, look at mine. I was the one catching, not delivering. But being on a team that won 23 straight, being on a team that was ranked number one for so many weeks, being on a team that went to the final four, it, it toughened me. And later on, when it was time to try again, if it wasn't for that, I never would have tried again. I would have been a coach, nothing against coaching, but I would never have played in the NBA. And I'll never forget that. Years later, 1987, I married, and Caroline, my wife, and I are expecting our first child. And we used to always come back to Charlottesville and train in the summer. And the first call I get is from Terry and Ann Holland saying, why don't you stay with us? You can stay in the Ralph Sampson basement apartment. <laughs> and I said, I'd be honored. Did you play Pac-Man? What's that? Did you play Pac-Man? Um, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, what was it? All that little Anyway, we, you got me there. Anyway, we were expecting our first son, and uh, he arrived on August 16th, and we left the Hollins basement that morning, at three in the morning, and brought him home to the Hollins basement, and we named him Kent Needlin. After Kent Needlin, we named him Kenton, and he's our first son. And that's because of the special people that Terry brought into his program, maybe not by design, but Ken might have been the best walk-on in the history of, uh, of, of the program. Uh, and all I can say again is to Ann and Terry, a great team, thank you for making the Ivoroni family feel so special. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> again, the standard and where we've been is bigger than basketball, and I think you're getting the feel. And um, I believe in that 76 uh, ACC uh, run, uh, 
and you can't do things without having good people around you, just like Mark said in this building that put this on. But I see a, a Tom Baker stand up and a Dave Cook. Dave Cook's dad played here, Cook Cleaners. He was our managers. Thank you, guys, for all you've done. Even though you lost the keys or whatever you did, ACC tournament, we forgive you, Tom. But those two guys, they've been around here forever, and um, Dave knows we love him to death, and his brother uh, uh, Todd over at uh, Cares Clean. That's been there for how many years? 60 years of cook cleaners. I mean, carriage cleaners, cook cleaners. I mean, I get them all confused with that. But I love that dude and his brother. They do all the uniforms for the band and all that kind of stuff as well. So thank you guys for your support and love. And I'm sure we'll see you later on this evening. It's good. Now, we'll stay on the end of the bench, but um, um, this guy here, Rick Carlisle. I mean, I don't know what to say about him. He's a Hall of Fame coach, a Hall of Fame person. His lovely wife is sitting over there and his daughter's coming to UVA next year. So stand up for a second, stand up. There she is, you'll see her around. She wants to be a book publisher. John Grisham is in this place, so you, you, you're in a good spot, you're in a good spot. Uh, but, 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 but Rick is, uh, we knew Rick was gonna be a coach, uh, like JJ, we knew that those two guys were gonna be a coach when we played. They just had that knack and the feel for the game. We would go to U-Haul every day and do the Pete Newell moves with Tom Newell's like every freaking day. And Rick knew, I mean, he's probably still doing them in your sleep, but he did those every day, and we played every day. I mean, we didn't have to, Coach, we didn't have to have time management skill. We played, ran every day. And so, and, it, and he's not only just a, a coach, friend, father, husband, but he's a cool person. He can play the piano, too, which I think he's going to do it with the labor. But, Rick, your experience here at UVA, now you look back with Coach Hallam, what's the special I'm under to take special leadership qualities, things you got from coach that you use now or your impressions of UVA because you came here because of, you want a seven footer, you can throw the ball to. I'm just messing yeah. <laughs> This is working? Yeah, it is working. Um, yeah, before I get started, I want to mention three people that are uh, very special people to the, to the Virginia program. Two of them are not with us anymore. Phil Wendell, um, Ralph, you mentioned, uh, has been a great supporter since 79. Um, he's a trusted friend. He's, he's, he's a guy that not only has, has helped the program, but he's been a mentor to myself and a lot of other uh, players that have transitioned into professional sports and life after professional sports. So, Bill, we appreciate you. Um, Good job. A couple other gentlemen, uh, Mr. Stuart Kessler, who was a quiet, dignified man who is no longer with us, but... Uh, he was a special friend, and um, he helped make the Virginia experience, you know, um, very, very different and feel like family. Uh, Richard Hendricks is the third guy. Ann and I talked about him. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, uh, no longer with us either, but his claim to fame in these circles was that he owned uh, a lot of the McDonald's in town. And so when I arrived here as a transfer in the spring of 81, um, Tim Mullen and Jim Miller were, were freshmen that were arriving in town. And uh, Ann had told me, you know, one of the things that Richard really, really uh, brought to the program was it was a creative marketing element. And so first time we went to the McDonald's over here on, um, on, Bar on Barracks Road, I walk in and a few of us walked in and Jim Miller is dressed as Ronald McDonald and he's doing magic tricks. And Tim Mullen is dressed as the Hamburglar. Okay, so, um, but anyway, those three guys and, and Phil, again, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done for me and, and so many in this, in this room. Um, my outside the box Terry Holland story, I, I told it earlier, is pretty interesting. Um, I was a transfer, I was at the University of Maine. I decided after a couple of years, I wanted to see if I could play at the very highest level of college basketball. And my contact, was Jim Laranega, who had recruited me when I was in prep school. He was at a Division II school in Springfield. Um, he had transitioned over to UVA. I guess they sent a private plane for him, according to, according to the story. Um, and so he was the, one of the phone calls I made. So I was able to get down here on a visit, and I thought it was really peculiar at the time, and I didn't realize this until later. Um, you know, Coach Laranega can be a guy that can get really excited about something, you know, kind of like over the top to the point where, yeah, are we really sure about this, <laughs> you know? 
And so the first day I was here, and Jeff, just know, Jeff knows what I'm going to say. Jeff was one of the guys showing around. He goes, hey, you want to play pickup? <laughs> now, these guys had just finished the final four like, you know, a week and a half earlier. And I was like, sure, why not? You know, and I've just watched, gotten done watching these guys play, play on TV. So we're, my first day on a visit here, I'm in University Hall, center court, <laughs> playing with Ralph, uh, Ricky Stokes, Othell Wilson, Jeff Jones, Lee Raker was out there. Uh, I think Lou Lattimore was out there, a bunch of these guys. And I'm thinking, geez, this is interesting. These guys would really like to play. Well, it turns out that, you know, I was on a visit. I hadn't officially been offered a scholarship yet. And this was actually something that you could do legally in coaching. They had the players auditioning me to see if I could play or not so to decide whether to offer me, offer me a scholarship. And so I guess I had a decent enough day. And Chris Mullen, who had been offered the last remaining scholarship, turned down Virginia to go to St. John's. And so I was offered the scholarship. And I, I came into a situation that from day one, was it was a family. Um, Coach Holland inspired so many of us in so many ways. He inspired me, Jeff, Anthony Solomon is here, um, a lot of other guys to get to get into coaching because he just had a way um, of, of problem solving. Uh, he, could, he could rise above pettiness, ego, anything to, to get a group of players to come together. We saw him bring a town together. We saw him bring a state together. Um, and, and it was it was amazing what he did, and, and it was almost effortless. Um, you know, he was kind but strong, uh, honest but empathetic, and he was always about doing the right thing. And and leaders like that, as we find in coaching, you know, the ultimate job is to create uh, an atmosphere and a culture of trust, and and to bring people together. And because of Terry Holland, we all had the experience of, of playing with Ralph Sampson or experiencing, you know, Ralph's greatness as a player, as, as fans here. And uh, that would, and Seth mentioned it, you know, that would never have happened um, had, had it not been for Coach Holland. So what I'd like to say is just thank you to Ann, Ann Michael, Kate. Um, Terry Holland is a man that um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever met a man in, in my life who did so much for so many and ask for such little in return. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, in your visit that you visited McDonald's. That McDonald's is still there. We can go here after that, get some fries, whatever, but we ate at McDonald's all the time. And then in Barracks Road, there was Ken Johnson's cafeteria that we had these meal tickets. You get a book of meal tickets, and you had so much money on meal tickets. And by the end of the month, you're like, I only got like $5 left. Y'all trying to feed me to make me gain weight, and I got $5 left for the week. That didn't quite work, but we would go to McDonald's all good as well. But you mentioned magic tricks. So you, we got Mr. Jim Miller. Mr. Mr. West Virginia basketball, basically, is what we call him. But he comes here, and um, he becomes a magician, and he's great in the community. He, he, the uh, radio uh, host here for the team as well. But, Jim, yeah, what is your history, what is your, remember the most about Coach Holland and his legacy? Yeah. Chet, there we go. Thank you, Ralph. Um, and first of all, I just want to send my condolences to Mrs. Holland and Kate and Ann Mike on your families, uh, like everybody else. And, and there's so many stories and the experience, the wisdom that Coach Holland would share doesn't go far as I look at you right now and notice that Tony Bennett's sitting over here and I can remember coming to you and saying, yeah, I'm going to be doing the color on the radio for this year's men's basketball team and I'm going to have to inter interview Tony Bennett after the road games. And you stopped me right there and you said, don't you call him Tony, you call him coach. <laughs> I'm going to share a, a couple uh, quick stories. Uh, one, you know, I've heard many talk about Coach Allen being very um, mild-mannered, and I can't believe that no one has really kind of said something until it got to me. But I, 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 I'll use the word he's passionate, okay? 
And uh, that's one of my favorite, you know, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles away to watch you burn. Love that. <laughs> and my junior year, it was the year after Ralph graduated, we're playing at Houston and they have Akeem Olajuwon, it's on national television and they're pretty good. And they jump on us early. And first TV timeout, we're sitting in the huddle, and Coach Holland is livid. His face is red. He's yelling and screaming. And I guess I was sitting directly in front of him. And he reached through the huddle, and he grabbed me by the jersey, and he started shaking me. And he said, Miller, you're playing like a blankety blank. I know, well, I mean, that got your attention, right? I don't know how the guys around me in the huddle remember it, but when it happens to you, you remember it. But I look back on that memory, that's, I, that's what I loved about him, because he was so passionate, he loved to compete. I didn't, might have not have liked it at the moment, but uh, when I look back on, on, on that, those are, those are uh, those special moments that I'll always remember uh, about him and many others. On the other side of that, he's a practical joker. And so I learned that early in our relationship, but late in the recruiting process. I was, you know, I was like one of the last kids in the country to sign national letter of intent. And I still hadn't made a choice. And it was the middle of April of my senior year. And Coach Holland called me and he said, hey, you're going to be around. I want to come, come uh, visit you. I said, sure. So he drove to Princeton, West Virginia uh, for the umpteenth time, I know. And, and there he, he, he pulled up. He's waiting outside of the high school in the parking lot. And I walk out to him, and he's sitting in a Jaguar. He goes, you want to drive it? I said, sure. <laughs> We drove around Princeton for the next three hours, but we really, we talked about life and what the experience might be like for me coming to Virginia and playing with my teammates. And then he dropped me off at, at my house and he drove back home to, to Charlottesville. And a couple of days later, because they didn't have cell phones back then, I, I was used to getting about a letter a week from Virginia, and this was a typewritten letter a couple days later, and it was from Coach Larinaga. And he says, Dear Jimmy, I understand you had a great visit with Coach Holland, talked about the things that, that would matter if you came to Virginia. It was a great fit, on and on. And in the last paragraph, it said, And by the way, Tim made his choice what color Jaguar would you like? <laughs> 17, 18 year old kid, what do I do with this? Like, mom, I'm going to Virginia, you know? I mean, it, was, it took me a couple of days to process that on how to respond. And Coach Holland, uh, on the phone, he called me and he said, no, no, no that was a joke, that was a joke. <laughs> Uh, but when I, when I think of his legacy, uh, to me, right, all those trips he made across the mountain over to West Virginia, we had a saying in West Virginia, always leave your campsite better than you found it. And it just makes sense, right? You make your place better than it was before you got there. And when I think of Coach Holland, that's what he did. The, the, the basketball program here in Virginia was better because he was there. The University of Virginia was better because he was there. Our community, Charlottesville, Central Virginia, the state of Virginia and college basketball, all better because he was there. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate that. Uh, so did you ever get a Jaguar or you just? <laughs> no, the, one of the other names mentioned earlier was responsible for the Jaguar, but it never made it to, no, okay. into my make possession. Sure you, make sure you got an orange and blue color or something like that. Good. Ralph, okay. you were here. Like any Jaguar was going to you. Just <laughs> uh, You know, I, I, I didn't have a Jaguar, but uh, we had a, a Chevy van, and um, 
my, one of my first trips back from Harrisonburg to, to uh, Christmas, I mean, uh, Thanksgiving, I had um, Craig Littlepage and Darren Cross in my car. We were coming back my freshman year, and we came, uh, which my mother probably told me not to go 33 because it's a windy mountain, but I went 33 and 29, and I came over this hill, and I wrecked the car. And so, but they had a good dinner, so it was all right. It was not, not a bad deal, so it was good. But that's the only I had, and then had to, everybody know the van and all that kind of stuff as well. Because you're like, if you're gonna wreck the car, you gotta get something bigger because we can't have you seven four folded up in the car. So that's how that happened. <laughs> we can move to Brian Stiff, and um, Brian, you know, he had two years with Coach Allen, and then yeah, actually Coach Allen retires, and Brian actually go went on to the NBA, played great with the Denver uh, Nuggets at that point in time. He was coached with Jeff and coaching now, and aspired to continue his coaching career. But if you had to do it over again, what would you do? There are, there are three things. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Coach Holland and his amazing wife and his family. Uh, there was an automatic connection, especially between Ann Michael and my sister. They became best friends. So I thank you, you know, for having me here in Charlottesville. But if there are three things that I would change, uh, the first definitely would be the uh, three-mile run that we had to do in the preseason. I came in last, so I'm <laughs> oh, I feel honored then. So when I first got here, um, I didn't know anything about preseason conditioning. Um, I'm from the country. See, Wally, you see how it happened, yeah. Rick? Okay. <laughs> that never came up in recruiting. So when I first got here, they said, okay, we're going to meet at 6 o'clock at the track, and we're going to run on the trail. I said, how many miles is that? That's all, you'll be fine. So we get there, everybody is stretched, everybody's stretching, and, and uh, they say it's gonna be three miles. And I'm saying to myself, oh Lord, I've never run more than uh, 400 meters in high school. I used to be on the track team. So I look at John Crotty, he has on bro games. Uh, <laughs> Richard Morgan and, and Mark Cook, they're paired up together. Um, I look at Anthony Oliver, he's standing beside me, and I'm like, okay, I, I think I have a chance. I, I can beat a guy who's wearing bro game boots. Uh, I think I can beat Richard Morgan because he looked like he, was, he had just gotten in. <laughs> and then um, they said, okay, go. And everybody takes off. Coach Holland was in the back, the coaches ran as well. So I said, okay, I think I got a shot. So me and Anthony, we got a good little pace going. I was wrong about Richard. Richard took off, him and Mark Cook. I was wrong about Crotty. He took off with his boots on. And um, the policy was you run your three miles on Monday. And if you beat Coach Holland, you don't have to run on Friday. So I said, that's a good deal right there. So we ran. We were going up and down the trails and about a mile and a half in. I couldn't see Morgan anymore. I couldn't see Crotty. Anthony Oliver had become my best friend, and he was running beside me because he felt sorry for me. So uh, I said, hey, old man, just, just go ahead, man. You, you don't need to be back here with me. You go ahead. And Anthony took off. And uh, so I was only ahead of two players, Curtis Williams. He was doing defensive slides as we were running, and, uh, and Brent Dabbs. And as I was coming the, uh, the last – Last, you know, quarter mile of the three mile run, I said, you know what? They probably gonna send me back to Brunswick County. I'm never gonna play here at Virginia. And um, we went the whole preseason. I ran on Monday and I ran every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Coach Holland came up at the end of the preseason and he said, Bryant, he said, um, I know you didn't do well in the, the three mile run and he said, can you run 94 feet? I said, like hell I can, coach. <laughs> and uh, he, he always had a way of inspiring you to be better. Um, no matter where you were, he met you right there, and he encouraged you to uh, seize the opportunity that was before you. Um, the second thing that I would change is he always talked about, we all talked about Coach Holland being a prankster. We came one day into... Uh, U-Haul, we all circled up, stretched. And then he said, everybody, let's go into the locker room. I knew something was kind of going on because, uh, you know, everybody was kind of laughing and snickering. And me and Anthony, we were walking together into the locker room. As we get into the locker room, um, they said, Anthony, uh, 
can you go back into the film room and lay out the scouting reports because we forgot to put those out. So as Anthony goes into the, to the film room, it was dark. Um, he disappears around the corner. And then all of a sudden, we just heard tables turning over, chairs and stuff just moving. And we were like, what in the world is going on? And Anthony is just running out, on, out of the film room, crawling on his back, backing up. And then here comes a 6'8 gorilla. <laughs> and I'm like, what in the world? And then Coach Holland takes the head off, and the big whistle had become a big gorilla. <laughs> I, I, I remember that just like that it was today. So that's another thing that I would change about Coach Allen. <laughs> um, and then the final thing definitely would be, um, you know, you always talk about Alpha and Omega, and I, I definitely was Omega. In 1990, um, Coach Allen's last season, we were playing Syracuse uh, in the uh, second round in the NCAA tournament that featured Derek Coleman, Billy Owens, and they had a great squad. And we ran this play called Thumbs Up, and it, it was like a shuffle cut for me coming to the block. And early in this season, um, we were down one point to uh, Coach Odom at Wake Forest. We ran that play. John uh, threw the ball to my left hand. I was po posting up on the right block. He threw the ball to my left hand because the double team was coming from the top. Uh, it was a great pass when, when you go back and look at it because he led me away from the defense. And I was able to turn over my left shoulder baseline and hit a 15-foot jump shot to win the game. So in the regionals, we were down uh, to Syracuse. We came back and had a chance to win the game. And I posted up on the left block this time. John threw the ball to my outside hand. But Derek Coleman, being the All-American that he was, Ralph, he double-teamed me on the baseline side. And when I turned, I couldn't get the ball over his outstretched hands. And he blocked my shot. And that was the last shot of Coach Holland's coaching career. If I could go back again, instead of me posting up, I would have faced up. Because when they left my hand, it was money. <laughs> it was money. The things that I wouldn't change is I played for a legendary coach, uh, Jerry Burke at Brunswick High School. And Coach Burke was a very mild mannered coach, quiet strength, and he, you know, he, he coached you know, in a spirit of love. And I wanted that when I went to college. And the final four schools on my list, all of those coaches exhibited that. But it was something about Coach Holland. I used to watch the, the games. It used to be a game of the week that came on. And I used to watch Virginia play. But they was talking so bad about Virginia, I used to turn the sound off because they weren't having a good season at the time. So I didn't want to be influenced by the commentators. So I turned the sound down, and I just watched Coach Holland on the sideline. And the way that his players responded to him, the way that he do his little cap, clap on the sideline, and the guys will respond and play so hard. I said, that's the coach that I wanted to play for. So when he came on my official visit here, um, he brought me over to his house, my family. That's when my sister met Ann Michael and uh, Kate. He brought us over to the house, and I'm sure all of you guys remember this. Coach Holland brought us over, and he cooked pancakes for us. I was like, man, we're going to get this. Pancakes? I didn't know. I'm like, man, we're going to get this every weekend? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. So uh, we had a great official visit. And then back then, the way it was set up, if the coaches always did a home visit and the coach, the team that you liked the most, that was the team that you were invited on the last day of the recruiting period. And Coach Odom and Coach Holland, uh, they came down to Brunswick to my high school coach's house, and they sat in the living room. And I asked them one direct question. I asked everybody, all of my coaches, one direct question that was on my final list. I said, do I have a chance to start as a freshman um, if I come to the University of Virginia? I asked that same question to the other three coaches. Two coaches told me no. The other coach told me that um, we wanted to play you at guard. And I wasn't really a guard. I was a forward. 
Uh, they had another great player who was the ACC Rookie of the Year prior to that. So I said to myself, I don't think that that's going to work out. But when I asked Coach Allen that question, this was his answer. He said, Bryant, I can't promise you that you're going to start, but you're not going to be dissatisfied with your playing time. And they always said that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And when he gave me that answer, it was just like saying, Brian, you're going to start. Because the only thing I wanted was an opportunity. And he gave me that here. And I'm so grateful for that. And what he poured into me and the rest of my teammates, we were able to do something special those two years that he coached us. And when I often look back on that, you always said that your coach reproduced his own kind. And what he did for that team, my first and my second year, we have a band of brothers that I think will be together for life. And I would like those gentlemen to stand up that played with me from 1988 to 1992. And we all, on behalf of them. Guys, will you stand up? <laughs> on behalf of all of us, Ms. Holland, Kate and Michael, we love you from the bottom of our hearts. And if there's anything that we can do for you, we're always right here for you. Thank you, thank you. And, you, you, and, you, and I love you there. Play with Richard Morgan. When he got on one of those roads, you just said get the rebound because he went, he didn't like, he, he, he uh, you know, he know where I'm going. He, oh, I know where you're going he, too. So he, check he, this out. Yeah, go I got ahead. you on that, right? So my freshman year, Richard Morgan had 39 points against North Carolina. I mean, he was hitting shots parallel Everywhere. to the floor. I mean, he was unconscious. That was one game. I led the ACC in offensive rebound in that year. rebound. You got to leave him a rebound somewhere. I have a good question. You know, Rich, but that's how man. Jumping and like, no one knows shots coming, but you got rebound. I love Dickie Moe. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, that's good. So I was going to uh, come back to you in a minute, but um, uh, the thumbs up play that you ran, right, Jeff? I don't know if that, that was the same play we ran, but uh, we were running that play. We ran it against Ohio State, and then JJ through this loud pass it was almost at the top of the freaking backboard. I caught it, dunked it. I sprained my ankle in that game. Joe Geek never believed in tape. He gave me like two strips and this, that, and other. Like, no golf, no nothing. Just no, wouldn't believe in tape. I don't know if he's here or not, but if Joe Geek's here, please stand up. I know he's there. I didn't say him. That's the best trainer ever. I know Ethan is here, and he got a row, but, and his wife stand up. I mean, there's Coach Holliman's on wife, Miss Bennett. But um, Joe, Joe Geek was uh, a special man, and we all know that as well. But Joe said, you know, just get your, you know what, out and, and uh, play. Let's go. I mean, suck it up. I mean, it's all good. He took care of me after when, when it was swollen, but it was all good from that standpoint. And then I used to hyperventilate uh, in the game, and, and Coach Allen would sit me down and calm me down. But Joe said, here's this brown paper bag. Just breathe in this brown paper bag, and you'll be all right. I'm like, okay, Joe. I don't know if that worked, but we, we had a lot of fun. And uh, even today, Joe Geek, again, I'm telling you right now, that's a special guy right there. And we love you to death, Joe Geek. I didn't see you over there, but now I know you. Yeah, I saw your name, but I think he figured here somewhere. So JJ would throw the ball. I would go get it. We had dunked the ball. We had fun. And, you know, probably one of the best point guards I ever played with, Ricky, obviously in that category. But JJ was the coach, as I said before. And... I want you to describe how you went from playing with Coach Allen to coaching with Coach Allen. And so what, and I was brand this as well, come back, you took some of the things from playing for Coach Allen and coaching with him to become a great head coach, and you coach it as well, so I'll come back to you guys in a minute. But JJ, what, what is your experience there? I know you got some great stories, because you and you all in the, in the locker room, and, and from most of that, then went to the office. Yeah, it was an interesting time. And uh, as a 17-year-old kid coming from Owensboro, Kentucky, to the University of Virginia, no, hold it on, was... Hold on. You, JL, Gates, Rakes, from the same... I mean, I don't know what was in Owensboro, but the water must have been good with Coach Allen because he brought four guys from there. And, and I'll come back to Lee Rake in a minute because, uh, you know, we had some experience there, but... Well, those, Tell those, me about those, that a little bit too. Those, those guys were from Louisville. That's the big city. <laughs> okay, there you go. Owens, Owensboro is not the big <laughs> That's city. That's it right there, right? Uh, coming from Owensboro to Charlottesville, Charlottesville was a big city. Okay. 
Um, but one of the things that uh, when I first got here, um, I, I realized, and it was, it was different for me, Coach Highland wasn't a very good cusser. <laughs> Maybe it was from lack of practice because he didn't, didn't do it a lot. And if he did, he was, had that towel and he would yell into the towel. My, my high school coach back in, in, in Owensboro had a PhD in cursing. <laughs> um, he, he could use certain words as a, a noun, verb, and adjective in the same sentence. So I always thought it was, you know, it took me, it was a, a little bit of an adjustment uh, to, to, you know, to when, when Coach Holland would try, it just didn't sound right. <laughs> um, I, I do think it was interesting, interesting uh, Jerry, you mentioned that Coach Holland was soft-spoken. Um, I'm with Jimmy on this one. Um, I, I think uh, he's probably a lot more competitive and fiery than uh, maybe, maybe people realize. But... Uh, you know, that first year, and I'm, I'm, I'm just or, you know, gonna kind of stream of consciousness here. Um, I can remember uh, spending the night at the Hollands, the, the night of our last home game. I had been in the hospital, I was sick, and you know, rather than taking me back to the dorm, I, I stayed with, with them. Um, I remember the basement, uh, Donkey Kong and uh, Pac-Man and, and, and your iced tea. And we even... You remember the, you remember the snake? <laughs> Ann Michael snake. Yeah. She had a snake pet. So it was, well, I, I always called Ann Michael Chuck. In fact, I still do. But because um, she wore her uh, Converse Chucks. There you go. Um, but I also remember we were there one night, and I don't know it was that, whether it was as a player or, or as a member of the staff. Uh, that was the night that Michael Jackson was on TV, and he did the moonwalk for the first time publicly, and that was a, a, a pretty cool thing. Um, I guess that dates us, uh, but uh, I, I was in your basement the, the night that, that that happened. We all knew, uh, obviously, that, that Coach Holland was a great coach. Um, we knew that he was really, really smart. What we also learned was that, that he was a fierce competitor. Um, it didn't matter whether it was running, uh, playing tennis, um, whatever it was, Coach Holland played to win. Um, I, I, I also re remember, you know, as, as, as a young coach, coach uh, I, I graduated, spent a little short time with Golden State. Coach Holland, uh, he, he saved a spot on the staff for me. He didn't have to do that. It was not until December and when I ultimately I got cut at, at, at Golden State, he welcomed me back with, uh, with, with open arms. Um, for a young coach, if you think about this, think about being in the office with a great head coach in, in, in Coach Holland, sharing the office with Jim Laranega, sharing the office with Dave Odom, sharing the office with Craig Littlepage, and no, I'm not gonna include Seth, I'm not putting him in that category. <laughs> but what an opportunity that, that, that Coach Holland provided me, not just to have a job, but to be able, again, as a very young coach, 21 years old, 22 years old, to be in that room and to learn, and not just to listen. You know, he, he actually wanted my input, which was unbelievable, you know, considering all the, the brain power that was going on there. I can still, I, I can envision it if we were sitting in that office and I'm sitting in the orange uh, fake leather couch right here and Dave Odom's desk was right, right about here and this was like in a 12 by 12 office. Um, and Dave was at his desk and Jim Laranego, their, their, their desks, faced one another, and Jim was in his, and Coach Holland. So his, his, his daily routine, he'd go into his office, and you, you'd hear him in there, right? He had his dictaphone. So he was dictating letters, and he was, uh, you know, we all know he was a really smart guy. He was a great writer, but he, he, he never wrote anything down. He did it with a dictaphone. 
Um, and you could hear him in there and he was getting all that stuff done. As soon as he could get that done, we never met in his office. We met in that, uh, that, that, that little square box and he would come in and he'd sit in, in the, the chair right there between Dave Odom and I and he'd lean back in his chair against the, against the wall. And we'd talk about all kinds of stuff. Never politics, never religion, but pretty much anything else. And it, it was great. So no, number one, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically in 1984, when Seth joined the staff, and it, excuse my language, but I'm, I'm quoting Coach Allen. Seth and Coach Laranega were the shit stirrers <laughs> because they're both from New York and they'd argue about anything. It didn't matter. And the, the, thing, the thing that Coach Holland wanted he, wanted, he wanted discourse. He wanted conversations. Um, and and it, was, it was amazing. And, and, and Dave and I talked about this last night. You could actually sit there and watch him. Even though we're participating, he was thinking through and he would argue both sides and top and bottom of every issue. And he was trying to find you know, where he was going to come out on, on whatever, it, it, it might be the box in one, it might be something, you know, uh, in, you know going on in, in the world. But he was so smart and sometimes he could outsmart himself for a while and then he'd figure it out. And it always, he, he would come down with probably the most logical decision, but also as, as I think somebody else said earlier, um, the right thing, whatever the right thing was. Um, I, I couldn't have asked for more in, in terms of a learning opportunity, uh, but just feeling a part of something really, really, really special. Um, you know, other, other memories, uh, you know, you talked about the play Thumbs Up. I, I don't really re remember the play. I remember the pass. Yeah, I remember the pass. I remember the pass. Yeah, it was actually above the square, and you went up and got it. And, and I kind of got credit for it. Yeah, I threw that pass. Assist, it was yeah. the worst. It was the worst pass I've ever thrown. Ralph made it look good. Um, but I, I also I remember, and uh, a, a last second play down at Georgia Tech. We were down one with less than two seconds to go. John Crotty was the point guard on that team. Bryant Stith was was on that team. We've we've got a timeout. We're calling the the last play. The play that we ran was a play that I had seen uh, in AAU basketball. The, like every team ran it. And I don't know if we had run it before then, Brian. I, I can't remember if we ever ran it. But, but think about uh, an, an ultra successful head coach in the ACC, right? Not having the ego, and he said, JJ, go ahead and write it up. <clears throat> And I, I, I could barely talk. I mean, I'm nervous. It's like, you, you got to do this. But so I, I get down there. He had such little ego. It was never about him. That I drew up, drew up the play, and I can remember it, like, because I said, John, if Bryant's not open, he cut me off. And, and I can't use the word that he used, but he said, no, I'm throwing it to Bryant. I said, okay. We put our heads in, hands in. We go out. They, they execute it beautifully, right? And people were saying something to me. And again, how often do you think that has happened? That assistant coaches don't do that, right? And, and Coach Holland didn't care. He, he just wanted to, to do the right thing. He didn't have an ego. And, 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 and we, 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 we won that, that, that year. I also remember a scary night in Atlanta, Dave, when Coach Holland got sick and he had to uh, go to the hospital. And we didn't know what the heck was going on. And Dave was the, 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 the senior statesman on that staff. And I remember he kind of all calmed us down because Coach Holland was our leader. Coach Holland was our rock. And without him,
you know, we weren't sure what was going to happen. And Dave did an unbelievable job of, of trying to hold us together during that time. But that was, that was really, really scary. So I, in closing, um, you know, Ralph had all the, 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 the former players stand up. And I was going to, because I think I, I know all of them, um, I was going to name them. And the reason I was going to do that is because I'm so proud and, and grateful, I think. And I think we're all so fortunate to have been or to be part of Coach Holland's legacy. Because as great a coach as he was, all the accolades and everything else, right? He was a great man. We were, we're really, really lucky to be influenced and, and touched by him. Thank you, guys. Thank you, JJ. I was driving one day um, down 29, and you know, I was standing out getting gas in my car. This guy pulls up, stops, comes back, and said, "You, Ralph Sampson?" I said, "Yeah, I, I guess I am." And he says, I, I, I remember you, but I remember this guy shooting baseline jump shots on your team. I said, who is that? He said, Terry Gates. No, I'm just joking, because Terry went out of <laughs> He said, Jeff Lamp. And uh, so, you know, some of the reasons I, I came here, I'll get into it in a minute, but JL was probably one of the best baseline jump shooters in the game of basketball. We all know that. Um, and all that I know is when I got double team, if I threw it out to Juan Lee could shoot outside, Jeff could shoot, JJ would handle it. But that was pretty much money in that baseline jump shot. I think everybody knows that. So, Mr. Jeff Lamp, and I give you the mic. And what's your favorite memory as a coach? You, you helped this thing and catapult it to another level as well. Well, first off, like everybody, thank you for letting me be a part of this. It, it means so much to me uh, to honor a great change his mic. So, it's better? It is, yes. Okay, all right. Anyway, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. So um, first thing I'd like to do um, is kind of jump off what Jimmy and JJ said, but uh, if we can just please put this Southern gentleman thing to bed. <laughs> I, I used to hear that so much and I would just roll my eyes every time I heard it because I promise you, being in a huddle with him, there's no Southern gentleman there. And when he lit into you, he lit into you. But uh, that was part of his passion, and, and uh, he communicated it in a way I wasn't really necessarily used to coming from high school, but um, very effective. And, you know, I, I have so many memories of my time here. A lot of them revolve around the people that are in this room, uh, former teammates and people that I knew. Certainly all the accomplishments that we had um, with, with the great teams that he coached, to be able to be coached by him. Uh, those are special to me even today. Uh, but I wanted to tell a very simple story, a little memory that I had that I think really speaks to who he was as a man, what he prioritized, what was important to him. So my senior year in high school, I was in the midst of doing my recruiting trip. So I was visiting the different schools, trying to decide where it was that I wanted to go to school. And I was lucky enough to be recruited by some good programs. I went to Indiana, um, Kentucky, hate to admit it, even went to Carolina. Um, Virginia was going to be my last visit. And so I was going to do that visit and then decide where it was that I wanted to go. Uh, so I flew into what was then that really itty bitty airport in Charlottesville. It was late in the afternoon and Coach Holland picked me up. Um, and I guess as he had done with most all of the recruits, uh, we went straight to his house. Uh, we're going to have dinner. I was going to meet the family. Some of the players were going to be over there. Uh, and it took about 30 seconds after walking through that door that I realized this was not going to be a recruiting trip like all the other ones that I'd had. Um, just the whole feeling, the vibe in that house was so warm and, and caring and loving and happy. And um, to see his beautiful young family at that time um, and to get to meet them, the players that were there um, seemed genuinely happy to be there and um, very much, I got the feeling like they felt like they were family. And 
um, that was important to me. And I, I didn't realize how much of that I really wanted um, in a school. It was certainly so different than anything I'd ever experienced up to that point. There were no family meetings. I didn't step foot inside anyone's house, any of the coaches' houses. Um, that was not really how it was done. But to be able to come and just witness firsthand the rapport between the players and him, the family. Um, Mike, I see you here. I think you had a broken jaw at that time. And I think you were staying there recuperating. Um, but that was just so very important to me. And um, I continued with the, the visit. And I remember on the way flying home, I still wasn't 100% sure on how the basketball part was going to work. Um, but what I knew was that Terry Holland was the person I wanted to coach me. Um, I wanted to be a part of his program, a part of what he created. I wanted to be one of those people in the house welcoming other recruits. And um, I, I will say that decision was 100% hard. I just followed my heart on that. And thank God that I did because um, for me, it was maybe one of the best decisions I've ever made. He brought the best out of me as a player for sure. In no way I would have ever been the player that I ended up being without him. Um, more importantly, though, he um, to have him in my life for all of his life, the rest of his life, as um, number one, to be coached, like I just said, but um, also to have him. He's certainly a mentor to me. Uh, really fortunate to be able to call him a friend. Uh, and in many, many ways was a father figure my whole life. I mean, the two greatest men that I consider my life or my dad and Terry Holland. So um, I did want to say thank you for letting me be a part of your family because I certainly have felt that from the day I walked in that very first uh, recruiting dinner. Um, it's been incredibly special to me and, and uh, it, it means the world to me. So thank you for that. And uh, more than anything, I guess I would just want to say um, for everybody here who had the fort good fortune to either be coached for him, by him, to be a friend, to have worked with him. Uh, none of our lives are the same without him. They certainly are not. He left um, an indelible imprint on my life um, and changed me. And I just know that I'm so much better as a man and a person than I ever would have been had I not known him. So. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask. It, it might not have been Grays Mountain Lodge too, but um, I'm sure Miss Holland might not remember. What, what did you? I mean, you. I, I understand the family and the house. Jerry Capone lives in that house still today, so it's a great house. But what did you have for dinner? I mean, was it Miss Holland's food or did, was it foods of all nations? No, the Miss Holland's food. See, I told I'll tell you. Tell you what. Well, a couple of things. I mean, the, the Grave Steaks. That was a big deal. I didn't find out about that till later on. Um, I always joke that the real selling point for me coming to Virginia was your sweet iced tea. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, you know, Bobby with Wiley and no screws and the, eight, the 76 uh, championships and all the good stuff as well. Uh, Ricky and him are like my brothers here, and we, we, we hang out sometimes as well. But he transitioned from, you know, the, the extraordinary point guard and – Bobby says Ricky was faster. Ricky says Bobby was faster. I don't know which one was faster, but both of them could run and, and beat everybody up and down the court and go back to Brian. Brian, I ran that three-mile course, and I was last every freaking time. <laughs> and as Ricky and them would go out, I'd go out and get there, and they coming back. And I still got two miles to go. But I ran it, and uh, Coach Odom, Coach Pay, everybody, we all ran it. And then they were like, come on, big fella, run. I said, but same thing. I can run up and down. 94 by 50, really good. But three miles I didn't like, so it's all good. But Bobby is one of those special dudes, you know, and we, we know him, love him. And he he not only was a point guard extraordinaire, but he took care of Coach Holland. He was Coach Holland's physician, you know, throughout this whole time being back. So, Bobby, how do you transition from that, your experiences and your love for UVA, Coach Holland, and all that good stuff as well? It's really hard, Ms. Holland. You know I love you very much, but I guess I, I knew Coach Holland for probably 47 years now. It's hard to believe. It's been 40, 47, 49 years. I knew him as a player. I knew him as a graduate assistant. And, and people say um, that uh, maybe he knew something that he had enough. He never encouraged me to go into coaching. He actually wanted me to go into medicine. So 
he gave me the graduate assistantship so that I could do some more, um, so I could do some more credits to get into med school. So he convinced me to do that. I have another story about Coach Holland, and I also knew him as a physician too, but I do have my story about Coach Holland is, is a little different from these guys up here. When I was recruited for UVA, actually, I wasn't recruited for UVA. Actually, I don't think I ever met Coach Holland. I never talked to him on the phone. I didn't know anything about UVA except for they played on TV every once in a while, they had these ugly uniforms of yellow, I mean, <laughs> of orange. And I said, I don't think I'm gonna look good in orange. So, um, and so I had, I had um, gone on and um, I had, uh, oh, this is gonna be hard. I had accepted a scholarship at another school in the university, in, in Virginia. And I got a, I had told that coach that week that I was gonna, Come, I was going to sign that that weekend, that next week, that I was going to sign the letter of intent. That next week, that during that week, Coach Holland's office calls my school, and they um, invited me up here to be a uh, for, to be recruited. Um, and so, I told, I, full disclosure, I did call the coach that I was that I was going to going to go to. And he said, and I told him that Coach Holland had office had called me and told me to come up here on an official visit. And I said, and he said, with fingers crossed, go on with your blessings. I said, okay. So then, um, but I did hear through the grapevine, I never, like I said, I never had this recruiting thing like these guys did. I heard that Jim Hobgood had come seen me play a couple of times and he was a driving force with trying to get Coach Holland to get me to come up here to, to UVA. Now, I accepted the, 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 um, the invitation to come here. I was, you know, I was not flown in. I was not bussed in. They didn't come pick me up. Actually, what happened is my dad and mom and my brother Ricky drove me up here to, to U-Haul. They drove me up here. Uh, we, had, we had a letter sent to us from UVA that gave us directions to U-Haul. So here we are, we're driving up here, Ricky and I in the back seat, and my dad and mom in the front seat, and we're just trucking along. You know, it's only like an hour, like an hour away on the other side of Richmond. And so I get here in U-Haul, and we drive up to the parking lot, and the first thing that I looked at and said was, wow, that's a, this, look at this big clamshell thing in the middle of nowhere. I was like, uh, this, this, this thing looks kind of ominous. It looks kind of old. This is a big clam shake. Well, you know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have, you know, the, the plane ride and I didn't have the, the jersey waiting for me with Virginia on it and my name on the back. I didn't have any of that. But when I, when I walked into to, to that stadium, I looked around and I go, boy, I could get my whole student body in the four rows on either side of this, this dome. That's how many people I had in my high school class. Jeff was talking about how he was, was from, oh, where were you from? Owensburg, oh, Kentucky? I mean, yep, I was from King William, Virginia. We had one blinking stoplight in the whole county. And so that's all we had. So coming to Virginia was just eye-opening, except for the first thing I remember seeing, like I said, was this big old clamshell thing. When I walked in, I saw that, like I said before, I saw those my, all my classmates, all my whole entire school could be in the first four rows. And then I thought about it as I got more. I said, you know what? You could probably put the whole county in this whole place. <laughs> so that was my first wow moment at, at university. My second wow, mo wow moment came when I actually was dropped off by my dad and, and, and Ricky and, and my mom at Coach Holland's office. He was very pleasant. He uh, thank my mother and father for bringing me up here and he actually patted Ricky on the head because Ricky was a little short thing and, and so he and so my next wow moment came when I suddenly realized this guy is six foot seven now I have never played against a six foot seven guy yet alone been coached by anybody that tall most of my coaches I could see eye to eye but no he was six foot seven but he was not very, very cordial, very, very nice. And so needless to say, that's where my journey began at UVA. 
Over the course of that weekend when I was here, he sold me on, the, on his knowledge of basketball. He sold me on his passion and his commitment for UVA basketball and making this basketball team and this community proud of UVA and taking them to the next level. He also looked at me when I said something about, he said, well, what do you think about playing at a place like this? And I went, well, coach, I, I, you know, I look around a little bit and to be honest with you, the, f the facilities are okay, but I think my high school locker room is a little better than yours. And he says, uh, we're gonna work on that. That, that. That's part of my vision plan too. And I said, and, and you know what? That basketball floor that's on the on U Hall, all it is is wood on top of cement, and that's hard. And he goes, well, we're going to work on that too. He says, but you know, I want you to be here because I think that you. And he was very smart in a lot of ways. He says, I think you can be an integral part in what UVA basketball is going to come. In my vision, he had a passion and a vision for basketball that I had never seen before. And so I called him and, I, and I'm sitting back there thinking as he's telling me all these things that, um, that this man, he is a gentle yet tall giant salesman. He is a really good one, <laughs> you know? And so I actually that weekend, I don't think I went to Miss Holland's house. I don't think I was even, I didn't go to your house. So I get, I, I need to say after we talk about all these things and, and to tell you how good a salesman he was, there were four guards already at UVA before I got there. So I would have been the fifth guard, but he claimed that I could be an integral part of UVA basketball if I came here. So needless to say that weekend, he, I signed the letter of intent because of Coach Holland. And his vision and his compassion and his, just his thinking and his demeanor, all that stuff just made me want to play for the coach. And I do say that, um, that uh, along with Steve Castlin, who is here with me, um, and Otis Fulton, who was in my, my uh, class that came in this year, that year, we actually had the, the highest scoring average of, of three combined players ever at UVA. We didn't score that much at UVA, but we did. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, but it leads to say, when I came here my first year, I did play all 116 games straight with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Steve Castle. And I do think everybody's talking about how people think outside the box. I do think Coach Holland thought outside the box because I um, was, like I said before, I was gonna go to this other school and then I ended up signing here. So I think I was one of the, what do they call this thing now? The uh, players that uh, can go from place to place now. I think I was a uh, UVA's first portal player. <laughs> so that's a, but as a physician, and I think Coach Holland knew that he probably wanted me to physician because he never put me in those rooms with all these guys when I was a graduate assistant. So, um, but when he came back to Virginia, um, at, when he was a sickness, um, it was very different having him as a coach, as a, as a uh, patient. Uh, I was honored, I was blessed, and it was a privilege to take care of coach. And my hands are shaking because it's just so hard. It really is hard. I would categorize our relationship as a special but uniquely hard situation. It was, it was the and I'm gonna to have to read this because this part had just really touched me more than anything else. It was opposite from our relationship that we've had in the past. For so long, Coach Holland was telling me what to do. And now, being coming back to Charlottesville, I suddenly had to tell him or help him navigate this illness that he had. And so part of me was going, hmm, maybe you ought to go run the trails. But or maybe you ought to be faster, but not real fast. You know, all the things he used to tell me. But I was, but I had to, I had to somehow help him navigate this illness that we all saw and that we all had to deal with. But I have to say this was in respect to Coach Holland, who I called coach for 40 plus years prior to him coming back. Our relationship was a little more difficult due to this disease state that he presented with. 
as a physician, my goal is to make someone's life better, somebody's health better. And my office motto is, that I've always tried to go by is, is basically good health is a blessing. But with Alzheimer's disease, which Coach Holland had, there's no cure and there was no definitive treatment. With only we can do is possibly slow that progression with this deadly disease. But we can help navigate, and what I had to do is to, with Miss Holland, or Miss Annie, I call her, we help navigate this world that we had. These navigate these pitfalls of this disease and to allow Coach to live out his best life he could have. Coach made my job and my life much easier. He blessed me with giving me a scholarship for UVA, being part of a team that won the first ACC tournament. He actually had me room with Wally. He, I don't know, somehow I got the nickname Nat, and I thought these guys was going to bring it up. I think maybe Coach Holland gave me that because I was a, a pest to most of the other players. But, um, but I do say that through this everything, that um, he made me a much better. We, we talked about the illness when he first got here. He was upfront with what he had. He understood what was going on and the progression of disease and exactly what we could and could not do for it. He never ran away from it. You know, he fought with courage, he fought with dignity, and he fought with a clear vision. And he continued that fight. He really did continue that fight. Like the coaches I knew back there in May of 1975. So with that, I just want to say, Ms. Holland, Ms. Annie, I love you, Kate and Ann Michael, you too. And I think we've all been blessed and we're all a much better people knowing Coach Holland. And I do thank him for not giving me the, the thing like he gave Jeff and told him to make a plan for a basketball team and made a great plan. Because if not, I might have been a basketball coach. Instead, he encouraged me to go to medicine. And that's what I did. Thank you, Bobby. So this is almost like the, the surreal back in you hall and uh, I'll speak a few words myself and thank these guys for being here and everybody here for being here as well. But as you say, I said better than basketball when I first started. And I had that theme through this whole time when we started to put this together. And you now see why it's better than basketball. I came to UVA in 1979, 80. It's my first year here and graduated from Harrisonburg High School. And in my last announcement coming to UVA, my mother and father was beside me. And if you go back and see the tape, it says, I think I'm going to UVA. And the press and the meet and the and stands, there's a couple thousand people there, whatever, it was from Kentucky. It was Coach Cal was there, I teed him again. And you said, Kentucky said, you think so, there's a chance you won't go to UVA. My mom hit me and said, no, no, you're going to UVA. So <laughs> you get ready to get out and go to UVA. So we did that. And then it was kind of crazy after that. But we went in IT my freshman year, and uh, Red Arback comes to the house and knocks on the door and says, you can play for the mighty Boston Celtics. And, you know, has some money with him as well and all that kind of good stuff. But the mighty Boston Celtics, if you come out this year and play for the mighty Boston Celtics, okay. Now, we had just won an NIT, and Kevin McHale was on the team, and he didn't play too well. So, Mark, we, we elbowed him a little bit. We did some stuff up there and that, that whole deal. Obviously, you taught me well and that whole deal. And I'm coming back to you. So he elbowed me. But anyway, I said, Boston, okay, great. And I looked over to ask my mom and dad, are we okay? Now, I'm still Coach Bennett, only 200 pounds. And I'm going up there with Robert Parrish and play against Daryl Dawkins. And, and, and you know, Mark, you know the crew up there in that time. It's all brutal men that would kick your tail if you came on the court. And Wally, you know it as well. So I started to come back to school, and we got in the weight room with Big John Gamble and Coach Don and Joe Keep over there. And within my first, between my first and second year, I, I gained quite a few pounds and some muscle, as you see on one of the Sports Illustrated. And, and those were real muscle, but it was after a workout, so I had to pump on as well, right? And we go to Final Four my second year, and I decided to come back again. Here's why I came back. Well, let me go back. Let me finish this statement. So Kevin McHale wouldn't have went to Boston. James Worthy wouldn't have went to the Lakers. Isaiah Thomas would not win the Detroit Pistons, right? 
three, three times in a row. So the NBA, that history is there. I came back each and every year because my mom and dad were fine. My mom would say, well, we worked all our life and we're fine. And if you make money, great. And we continue to work. My dad worked till he was 80. And, uh, and, and my mom didn't put him out the house. He just went to work every day and hung out and, with his guys at 6 o'clock in the morning, ate breakfast and went to the city and did whatever he wanted to do. But I came back. I came here, one because it was close to my parents and they could watch me play game every day. And they did. I came here for Coach Holland because his car, he says, knew GPS before there was a GPS and was at my house all the time. And Miss Allen them came and you guys came as well. So they was at a lot of my games as well. And I came to games here as well. I came here also because, and, I, and I'm going to talk to somebody bridging the gap, because I came here, as you see with these guys here, it ain't about Ralph Sampson. Let's get that right. It ain't about UVA basketball. It's about bridging the gap. And, and, and uh, we talked about this as well. Whatever, I'll take a quote. It's not about the color of your skin. It's about the content of your character. And all these guys here have character. All you guys out there have character. Coach Allen had the biggest character, right? So for me, it's not about what the name Ralph Sampson calls. There's Ralph Sampson the third out there, but the Ralph Sampson the one is in heaven with Coach Holland. So with all that said, when things about this university is said, no matter where you come from or where you work, I seem, and it hurts my heart, Mr. Ryan, that things are said about this school with diversity or a New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and all that kind of stuff. I read it, we read it, we see it. It hurts us as well. We support you guys 100%. But with this situation, let's bridge this gap. If anybody in here has any animosity about the school or about relationships or about anything you got in your heart, when you leave it today, let's make amends to that because life is short. We're all going to leave this place at some point in time. Coach Allen is gone, physically, but his spirit that will live forever with his grandkids, with his daughter, Miss Holland. And Miss Holland, I mean, we already know that's our mom. She will rule no matter where she goes, right? So bridging that gap, I stayed here. I graduated on the lawn on a rainy day. And when I go around the country, People say, oh, it's rain, whatever. But there was champagne bottles popping and other people's, whatever it be. But it was fun. My parents were there. My sisters were there. And so I want to be that big. It ain't about me. I talked to Rick Carl about this a little bit last night. It's about we. It's about us. It's about this university. As great as it is. This is one of the historical universities in the world. We got a great coach and a great family. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. But it's time to take and bridge that gap between then and now to the future. And I'd like to win more championships. I'm sure you would too, all right? So I thank you guys. You guys can sit there. I'm gonna bring up um, you know, the next piece is, and, and, and I'm gonna ask Ms. Allen a question. I'm gonna see what she said about it. We have Carla Williams coming up next, <clears throat> and I know Mr. Ryan, can they come together? President Ryan. I don't know if you want to come, but I, I got to pay respect to respect. And uh, come on up. And I know you didn't know Coach Allen well as we did, but we respect what you do here. Because there may be a library, a Holland Library coming. There may be a, as Colin Perry here, Coach, I say, can we do the Holland Classic and can Kentucky come here and play us? And Well, we got to beat them. So, love the AD. And... I'd be remiss, and, and, and Coach Page, you know where I'm coming from. Um, uh, Coach Page was an AD here for a long, long time, his beautiful daughter, wife, et cetera, et cetera. And he takes some credit for bringing Tony here, which he should, because when we were at the Final Four, he said, well, Coach, I said you was part of that. And you remember I told you that in the stands. Transition to Carla. Now, she's done a great job. I was up there when she was hired here in her, in her press conference. And you have a tough job, I told you that then. But wow, what a wonderful person she is. And, and although she had me out the other day with some freaking goats. Now, there's some goats here in Charlottesville, and I was with some baby goats, and it's a video. But Carla, 
Mr. Ryan, Coach, y'all can just have a few words and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. So I have uh, Coach Bennett up here with me and President Ryan to help me because we are representing the University of Virginia. We're representing Virginia basketball and we're representing Virginia athletics. Miss um, Ann and Michael, Kate, uh, thank you for being so gracious and so kind and so loving. Um, I didn't know Coach Holland the way that everyone else knew him, um, but if the spirit that you guys move with is the spirit that he moved with, then I do know him, so thank you. So we have uh, a, a special presentation, um, and I would like to ask uh, for Miss Ann and Michael and Kate to please stand. And I would like for all of us um, to direct our attention to the rafters for a special presentation there. So th thank you um, for sharing Coach Holland with so many people for so very long. And I know what that means because I was a coach also and I have a family. So I know the sacrifices that you guys um, have made. All of us, whether we've known him for 40 years or four years, all of us in athletics and related to Virginia athletics um, or the university, we are the beneficiaries of his impact. We all are. So we thank you and we love you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Um, make sure I got my notes right, right, before I mess up. but. Uh, that's special and we always we remember that for sure. So up next is, I'm going to do that, is I think Coach Holland's look-alike and uh, all the grandkids. So the special one, the lot of grace, she made these bracelets for everybody and the very special young lady, very smart. If you come in the building, you see that little picture there with Coach Holland, the character of Coach Holland, she drew that. And if you ever see some of her work, she's, she's really, really good. So I'll have them come up and they can introduce and they have a few words to say as well. It's so nice being here today, looking out over this gym at all the people who have been impacted by my grandfather. I've loved hearing all of these stories from everyone. Some I've heard a thousand times and some are new to me. It's clear he held a lot of different roles in a lot of different people's lives. And even though I called him coach too, his role for me was granddad. He would take me to do typical grandfather things, whether it was coming to my games or taking us fishing and clamming. Every summer was the best summer with coach. The hours spent out on the boat with him felt long at the time, but I'd give just about anything to get a few back. Every year on one of our birthdays, he would take us out and we would fish until we caught the amount of fish is how old we were turning. I still vividly remember on my 12th birthday only catching seven fish after being out there all day. Then again, woken up at 7 a.m. the next morning to finish the job. <laughs> he was always teaching and motivating. That second morning, we tried, to, we tried new lures and a different fishing hole. And he said, sometimes it's not the job that's too big. It just requires a different, different strategy. <laughs> He was also there for a lot of me and my brother's athletic careers, though not really as a coach, more of as a support. He lived in Wilmington for a little bit and he was able to ride with me to a lot of my basketball practices. And he would spend time watching me at practice, but it never felt like having a coach there to watch. It mostly just felt like time I was able to spend with my grandfather. Taking the 20 minute drive there and back, listening to songs he liked and songs I liked, talking about college basketball and what games were coming up, 
all the different fishing spots up and down the intercoastal. It was time I valued then and time I value even more now. Coach, in my mind, was always the expectation of, a, of what it was to be a man. He was someone I wanted to make proud, someone I aspired to be, someone who was caring and someone who was tough. He never backed down from a challenge and he would always help me overcome challenges that came my way. He's someone I will hold in the highest degree and like all of you, I miss him very much. Some people think Coach was intense or competitive. I never saw that in him. He was just always so supportive. You could call him any time and he would be there to listen. And sometimes when you didn't know what to say, he could just sit with you in silence. Coach was the best teammate. He would always take your side more times than I can count. When I was homeschooled, he'd pull up to my house or two down and text me and I'd run outside the door to catch my getaway car to go to lunch or go fishing. <laughs> Leaving my work behind, it made my mom furious, which made it even more fun for us. <laughs> the last couple years have been pretty rough, and as we lost a little more and more time with my teammate, his teammates stepped in. Coach Odom and Uncle Ralph and Coach Nestor realized I was man down and suited up and subbed in. And it's meant the world to me. Coach Odom would call and say, I know your granddaddy isn't able to be there like he was, so you just talk to me. If you need me, I'm here. And looking up in the stands and seeing Coach Nestor there at each game doesn't replace Coach at all, but it makes it hurt less. They all remind me of Coach so much, and I'm grateful that they are in my life. It's nice not to feel alone when things are tough. Some of my favorite coachisms are be humble, don't whine, complain, or make excuses, take your hat off inside, look folks in the eye when they are talking to you, and the stats don't lie and they don't play favorites. Eliza Gray, do you have anything to say? I was really lucky to live with Coach and Annie in Denver. I kind of know what my mom felt like growing up, feeling so loved and special. Because that's how Coach, Coach made me feel too. I promise to pass on everything he taught me. And uh, as a testament to, you know, great things in small packages, I'd like to introduce my grandmother, Ann Holland, to come up to the stage. <laughs> um. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even though she was the reason I'm not 6'10", we love her anyways. <laughs> President Ryan, Ms. Williams, Ms. Bennett, Coach Bennett, thank you. You guys, you did a great job. Thank you very much. And I do love you all. That's great. I just feel like you're mine. It's really funny. They're old, and I feel like they're mine. That's really weird. <laughs> the man we all know as Coach has been the sun for my orbit since I was in junior high school. Back then, he was just Terry, the son, the big brother, the introverted, hardworking, tall, and shy kid who didn't really say very much. But when he did, we knew he was a dark horse who would bring a lot of light into this world. I knew he would be something, something to a lot of people. I knew he would draw people in and connect them out of his love for creating a team and watching any of his teams succeed. I just really had no idea just how powerful those connections would be as I continued to be in awe of his legacy. 
Terry enjoyed many, many wins, successes, and highs throughout his over 50 years in college athletics. Without a shadow of doubt, he would say today, he rests easy knowing he finally won. You see, today in one giant room with a basketball court as the stage, the team of his lifetime has come together. He truly loved each person that's here today, and this is his dream team. That dream team is not made up solely of basketball stars. He knew more than anyone that there was no basketball star without hard work of countless individuals supporting them. The managers, the administrative staff, the young administrators of the future, the families, the fan base, and the custodial service staff. Every single person held the same exact value and were critical in creating the dream team. And here you are. Nothing would make Coach happier than having all of his favorite people gathering together under his wings. And here we are, under his wings. The UVA, Davidson College, East Carolina, and Clinton, North Carolina families, all here. All those who believed in his undaunted journey to better the experience of the student athlete, a student athlete like Rick Carlisle, who will accompany his favorite musician, Bruce Hornsby, to play our favorite song, All united today to remember the valuable lessons that he taught us, I've been given the gift of countless once-in-a-lifetime opportunities during my 60 years alongside him. Perhaps the most important, meaningful time is really not the Final Four. Nah, it was, wasn't the title. It wasn't an unexpected win. It was just a simple radio interview that Coates participated in, in years ago in Greenville, North Carolina. The interviewer was and is his biggest fan of all time. The subject is quite possibly what all of us gathered here today that we're yearning to know before we leave today. Please listen as I interviewed my forever teammate and asked him, how would he like to be remembered? You've spent your life paying back because you've had so many people who've believed in you and helping you. When it's all said and done, how do you want people to remember Terry Holland? Like most people, I, I just want to be able to say that I did the best I could to make a difference, to leave the world a better place than I found it. And I think that's what drives all of us. But just try to leave the environment that you pass through better than it was before you came through is, is the what I'm trying to establish in my own mind, as well as set an example for our children and others who come behind to be able to do that, is just to make a difference. Reminded of the uh, Jewish Midrash, a group of workers is asked by their teacher to do something extremely difficult. And of course, the workers rebel. They say, this works too hard. We, we don't have the right tools. They come up with all sorts of excuses. And plus, we'll never finish this work. And their teacher says to them, it's not for you to finish. It's for you to begin. And when you think about it, that's what we all do. We begin. And that's how you make a difference in the long term, by beginning, not by focusing on the result. And I think that's the real key for all of us as we pass through this world to leave it a better place. It's like the little boy who encounters thousands of starfish washed up on the beach. A gentleman comes by and of course tells him, look, you can't possibly throw all these starfish back. You can't make a difference. And the little boy right in front of him picks up one more starfish and he throws it into the ocean. And he says, I'll tell you what, 
it makes a difference to that one. If you've got uh, you've got a dream and you're willing to dream big and you're willing to go after that dream, there's uh, no limit to what you can accomplish. It's incredible. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, the members of the panel for bringing to life all the special person that Coach Holland was to all of us. Oh, just wearing it on a lapel. Uh, to all of us, um, look, let's face it, Coach Holland touched all of us, and his spirit is going to live through all of us. He might be gone, but he's surely going to be in this building and be, his spirit will be carried through, through our generation and generations far beyond us. And uh, thank you so much for being here and giving us an opportunity to share these memories with you. If everyone can please remain seated while the family leaves, but first I gotta give it to the big man here. What an amazing job, Ralph Sampson. You, you taught me well, you taught me well. So, so we'll have uh, the Hollands get up. They'll proceed up, and then we'll we'll receive them out in the front of JPJ. So, Miss Holland and the crew. Hmm? And Sandridge, Sandridge Hall. Okay, up in Sandridge Hall, right outside there. So, thank you guys, and.
thank you for coming again. And, um, you know, we won't do this again in no time soon. Everybody stay healthy and um, stay together and let's bridge the gap and, and, and create even a more special UVA. I, I know we got the people, we got the president, we got the coaches, we got the staff, we got the history. And, um, you know, I see Doug Elgin looking at, he knows what I'm talking about. Even my SID, he, he, he took me around everywhere I went, uh, giving them time to get up steps. And uh, Teresa did as well. And the Odoms and Miss Burke, I mean, just numbers of people here that are very, very special. And uh, I think we headed in a place where, you know, it, it, it's unseen. The, the, the campus is beautiful. There's buildings going on all over campus. Um, I'm excited. I was in the Darden School Hotel today, and it's like, oh, my goodness, that's not Charlottesville. It's not Darden UVA that I'm used to, but uh, it's, it's, it's massive and impressive. So keep up the good work, and uh, God bless everyone, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.